I've I spent some time researching and I've read all your books and everything. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> it's terrible. <laughs> terrible. The the brain damage. It's just, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can't believe I'm still making a living slinging sentences, but it's, it's happening. So Mike Finkel, you are a New York Times bestselling author um, three times, I believe, three books that you've come out with, True Story, The Stranger in the Woods, and your most recent book, The Art Thief. Every book you've written is a New York Times bestseller, as far as I'm aware. <laughs> Long time photo jur- not, uh, journalist, working with photo journalists, but for National Geographic, for New York Times Magazine, GQ, Men's Journal, all the top magazines. We met in Nepal over a decade ago on a National Geographic expedition to Mustang, Nepal. I was um, a young kid intern, you could say, climbing into these caves with some North Face climbers, finding ancient artifacts, uh, pre-Buddhist scriptures and burial sites, with golden masks and bejeweled daggers. I mean, it was it was pretty Indiana Jones. What what was your take on that whole experience? Tell tell me about the story that you wrote. All right, I'm like all these images are flashing through my mind. That's where I'm just going to tell you what's coming into my mind. Yeah. Besides the fact that it was almost like I think I love the way you said Indiana Jones, but I mean this was real. This was nonfiction. That's a freaking movie. But yeah. yet, uh, he. Who's Pete the, Athens. Pete Athens. Okay. Pete Athens, the, I don't know, the lead climber, yeah. I don't know, whatever you want to say, was like literally pulling treasures out of a cave, like that golden burial mass, like that hadn't been seen in 700 years. Like yeah. it was that moment when I was sitting on the ground and he was pulling treasures out of this burial tomb. And I was, I just will never forget that. It's like one of those things where you're like, I cannot believe that I am here to witness this. Also, at the same time, because I'm who I am, I was like, damn, I wish I was up in that cave. Yeah. Uh, Itself, I'm like so close. I'm like on the front row, but, you know, Pete's playing shortstop for the Yankees. I'm just in the box seats. Um, I do remember from that trip knowing it's really important in life to know what you're not that good at, by the way because that'll keep you alive. I learned on that trip, this is just a selfish thing, but it's like in my mind, I learned that I'm not a very good rock climber on that trip. Like that, the rock was really manky and I was like, oh, I'm gonna. It was terrible rock. It was, <sighs> it was dried mud. And, and this is part of the reason there's hand dug caves there. There's only really a few spots in the whole world, Cappadocia being the other notable place where people were able with primitive tools in an ancient time to hand dig apartment complexes right. into the rock. So the the rock is that brittle and um, malleable, which is not good for climbing. You want, you want the most solid rock possible. I think fear is a really important thing to like experience and embrace. And uh, I tried to do a little climbing on that thing and it scared the poop out of me. Yeah. And uh, I like truly deeply was scared. I was like, I mean, I think Corey was talking about there was a cameraman on an earlier trip that Lincoln L- Lincoln got Lincoln got hit in the head with a rock and was immediately air vacked out in a helicopter and almost died. I mean, it broke his skull. His brain was visible. I mean, it was that bad. And he's okay now. He's um, recovered. But that was, I mean, it was a dangerous environment. It was a dangerous environment where literally things could hurtle from the sky and break your head open and did. And then there's all this juju, like we're going into caves and burial things. I remember we had like a local um, anthropologist who was making sure, I mean, we were, we were, we were national geographic, so we were playing it right, but dang, that was like a, there was a little bit of fear and danger that sort of wound through. And we're so remote that if someone did something just even like normal, like broken, it broke a bone. Yeah. uh, We were far from help. And weeks of of trekking and driving and planes and I mean, we were so far back there i loved it <laughs> i love that stuff just like thinking about that this like um g- wait i just want to pause i i swear you told me and this is so long ago that apologies if my memory is wrong that when you reported for the new york times magazine in gaza that you had 
rental cars run over by a tank? I mean, this is pretty close to it. Uh, if you'd like to, you know, that story briefly, you know, I, 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 I'm fascinated by extremes of human behavior. And if people are trying to kill each other, that's pretty extreme. So I'm, I, you know, uh, I've been to a few war zones and in Afghanistan after September 11th, 2001, I spent about seven months in Northern Afghanistan with a photographer, Chris Anderson. And um, in one of our misadventures covering the war, we were we were in a rental car with a driver. It was a driver, translator, photographer, myself, four people in a, a mediocre renter car in Afghanistan. Uh, we were like, there was a big Taliban retreat on tanks. And uh, we were like, let's follow that line of tanks and see where the Taliban retreat to. A little bit of a dangerous idea unto itself, now that I'm saying it. But... Um, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> no, shocker. So we're on a dirt yeah. road and it turns out that um, we had slightly miscalculated and there was actually a tank behind us. We were in the middle of a retreat, not following it. And so Afghanistan hills, like just everyone picture like a very steep hillside where a little road is carved out of it. So on your right, uh, there's just a drop. You could like, you I should probably write your last one testament before you hit the ground, absolute death. And on your left, it's just a, a hillside that's unclimbably steep. So you're just basically riding along a shelf. Um, a tank is behind us. A tank is much faster on a gravel road than a crappy rental car. And so this tank is coming up behind us and I just know the situation that um, they're not gonna slow down. This is a war zone and this is, they're retreating and they're going full speed. And I remember looking out the back of this car thinking this is a very bad situation. This tank is getting closer and closer and closer. Obviously the driver whose car it was, was flooring it. I'm looking at the Chris. I'm looking at the interpreter. I'm watching the driver, and it's like, I don't think of any good. I don't. I can't think of any good ending to this scenario. Anyway, here I am telling you the story. So obviously there was at least a decent ending. So the tank got closer and closer, and I will never forget this. The driver made a very wise decision. He put two wheels on the left hand side up on the thing, so the whole car is tipped at a 45 degree angle. I remember that Chris was to my left. I grabbed Chris, the photographer's shoulder, the translator who was in the passenger seat, grabbed the driver. And so like four of us are high siding basically on a raft that's about to tip over while a tank drove over our car. The first thing I remember is every single piece of glass shattering at once. Then I'm like, this could be it. The tank rolled. All four of us survived without injury. The car looked like half a car regular without, and then a flat other half a car where the tread of the tank did it rolled over it. We all looked at each other. It wasn't even like this, damn my car or my laptop. It was like, and we had to walk like 14 miles on a dirt road back to the nearest town. And none of us said a word. We just started walking back to town. That's that story. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, was it a rental car? Oh yeah. Which, which, are you like permanently barred from renting from Hertz or something? I mean, is, this, was Afga on... this was Afghanistan. So but that you, was, did you was... Oh, that was Afghanistan. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So in Gaza, I rented a car, which only just got every window smashed out in a riot. <laughs> You're on <laughs> some one... rental car blacklist somewhere. I mean, like... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there was one time in Alaska. Yeah. There... <laughs> uh, here I am to tell this tale if I have to pay for a car. So I, so it, it's possible it'll show up in my expenses. Yeah, you're on the, the rental car no-fly list. They're like, oh, I don't know. <laughs> like, <laughs> Save yourself before your car, please. <laughs> yeah, yeah I was going to ask, I mean, you getting a job, a bunch of different jobs, but with National Geographic, it's like, how do you get a job with National Geographic like that? Who did you have to kill? <laughs> I mean, I'm not going to tell you who I had to kill. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, uh, it's right. a dream job, right? I mean... Yeah, I mean, definitely it has huge pain in the ass aspects to it, but a dream job. Yeah, so just, I love National Geographic magazine, but it's not really, it's like, it was a great challenge for me to fit what I wanted to say into their mm -hmm. rules. And mm -hmm. so, well, trying to sound non-grateful, non I think that the actual creative part of writing for National Geographic. It's a big organization. It's a bureaucracy. There's, I know all this. I didn't mind it. I yeah. didn't mind writing articles for them, but I, I, there was a lot of like, there was a lot of barriers and yeah. I tried to, I mean, I'm not going to be like, oh, you must write this in blank verse poetry. You know, I wasn't going to like extend them, but it was always a challenge to me. And I didn't mind that challenge. It was like, uh, you know, I grew up writing for print. 
like back when they, like people read newspapers on paper and there was like a finite amount of words. And I was like, it wasn't like, oh, I need to write four times the amount of words. Like, you know, you're 20 years old, you're writing 400 words about, you know, high school soccer. <laughs> yeah. And I would always fit it into that space. And so that was very, it was good for me to learn how to be yeah. compact and write. I, I mean, I don't know what other pe writers will tell you, because all I know about is photographers, other writers. I don't know anything about them. And it's like, you're never like, oh, pair with another writer, Mike. It's always with a photographer. It's a solitary pursuit. Or yeah, I mean, there's not two writers, but I could tell you a lot about photographers. Yeah. I um, want to get into that. In a, yeah. We'll talk about that. I love talking about photographers. Yeah. I always think that maybe photographers should go to writers conventions and talk about writers and writers should go to photography conventions, and talk about photographers. Talk but, about a hack that I love that. No, but just because I've worked with like 50 amazing photographers. I know photographers. I've worked with no other writers. So I don't know what the hell writing's about. I just know what I'm doing. Like I'm ready to talk about. <laughs> I feel that way as a photographer, um, <laughs> for sure. You know, yeah. I go on these shoots with people who've worked with other photographers and I'm like, well, what do they do? You know, what am I doing versus what they're doing? You don't have the frame of reference. Right. I'm just like, this is working for me. I mean, I'm, the, the paychecks are getting cash. So I guess this writing part is working for me, but I would really like someone to tell me what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> to come in and supervise. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it seems very inefficient, this whole uh, what, writing thing. Okay. I remember... One of the things I remember most from that Mustang Nepal expedition, and that, that was really formative for me. I mean, going on a National Geographic expedition, I think I was 19 maybe. And yeah, I think and you might have been. Yeah, it ended up becoming a whole, a whole thing. I mean, a cover of the yellow book in certain countries and a documentary film and all of that um, kind of blew my mind at that stage in life. Meeting people like you, meeting people like Corey Richards and Pete Athens who've made careers in creative pursuits, adventurous creative pursuits. Um, I didn't know that was a thing. I didn't know that was possible. Um, those experiences, that experience and some others to a large extent made me who I am, you know, made, gave me um, an idea and a motivation to strive for that kind of life. Um, so that was a really formative experience. But one of the things I remember was we shared a tent together for weeks and right, we were kind of roommates. We, we were roommates. Yeah, yeah. Um, your your book, uh, true story, had just come out, I think, sometime around then. Right. It right. was not yet a movie. Right, right, right. And and I hadn't, I didn't know about it. I didn't know about you before this trip. And uh, you told me the story, your story, true story, each night slowly. <laughs> In Sorry our tent, <laughs> you no, you would you were every night. It, it was like story time with Mike, and you would you would share a bit more, and it was <laughs> it was great. It was like the entertainment for the evening. Learning this whole thing, I I think it was only a few years prior that all of this had happened for you. Funny, I was just thinking. I was like, I was like your Shahrazad, like a thousand and one, you know, Finkel nights. Uh, yeah, you know, I'm trying to tell you this. I'm like, I'm a little embarrassed that you said that. I'm like, man, I hope I didn't just like, just run my mouth off. But I'm telling you, Ted, <laughs> that um, the way I, I like to write in a way that has the sense of being conversational. And I like to tell the stories that I'm working on or have worked on orally out loud. But I mean, that's, I think the way humans have shared things since we've been human. You're crafting. To some I, I really like to tell a story in a very relaxed way. And so I practice like, you know, writing is both the solitary pursuit, but I love going to the bar room or a tent and like, what are you working on next, Mike? And I start telling the story and sometimes ad nauseum, sorry about that. But it really is like my rough, rough drafts is mm -hmm. like the oral telling of it. Like, I, again, I have no idea what other writers are doing, but like, if you say to me, you know, Mike, tell me about your latest story. I'm not going to start like... The sun was setting in the west and campfire streaks crossed the sky. You would just look at me the like... Lapis lazuli sky. Yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah. You have to have lapis lazuli. <laughs> and like, like, you know, nobody starts a story. I mean, if I started a story that way, you would just roll your eyes like, what the hell? Like, you turn what, off. Yeah. That's why I don't start any stories like this. Right. Like, dude, there was this art, you know, art thief. Or let me tell you, there was a guy who took... All right. So in a nutshell... True story. I, I feel like nutshelling this because yeah. it feels like a long time ago. So basically, 
I'm trying to think about a, a 40, like a two minute version of this story. I'm just going to tell the two minute version of this story, uh, including the, uh, you know, I'm an imperfect human being to say the free, I make, I make like three mistakes before breakfast. I haven't had breakfast yet today, so I have a chance to make a few more mistakes. Um, I was working for the New York Times Magazine. I was fired from the New York Times Magazine for having one of the characters in a, in a feature um, article. Uh, it was a composite character. Didn't make anything up, took a bunch of interviews, combined them together to make them one person. It's done in journalism, but it's against the rules of the New York Times. It's very strict. And I knew that, did it anyway, got caught, was fired. Absolutely crushing career experience at that time, I would imagine. Mm, at m that times, at that and even more, seriously. Like, I mean, uh, I, there's been enough passage of time that I can sort of say it without feeling like terrible, but I felt beyond terrible. Like my entire sort of, this is pre-children, pre-wife, pre-anything, my entire sort of existence was wrapped up in being a hotshot reporter for the New York Times Sunday Magazine, which is pretty much the greatest gig in journalism, which is that you get to write long form with a huge budget and a big, important audience about every topic under the sun. It's not like it was like bicycling magazine. There's pretty limited- It's a dream job. It was almost like People didn't even dream of that job. That's how dreamy of a job it was. It's like you better, you better, you better watch your dreams. Like, did it feel like at the time a fatal career blow? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think I was thirty years old, twenty nine, thirty years old. Yep, happened in the year two thousand when I was fired. So yeah, I was thirty years old, and I had reached like the uh, this combination of absolute pinnacle job with tons of energy and feeling like everything was just you know, 30 years old. It wasn't like 70 when I finally achieved this. And so I thought, this is it, I've made it. And then was like blown off the top of the mountain in a huge gale. And I thought, I will do nothing more than wait tables. I'm gonna perish in this storm. Yeah, this yeah. is it. Yeah, that's it, I'm done. So yes, I, there's might be a level of glibness and flippancy in my voice right now because there has been the cushion of decades, but it was beyond crushing. Okay, so what? So, so you've had this okay. near fatal blow. Yes. What happens next? So I, I basically lost. I mean, I was Michael Finkel of the New York Times. Like that was me, and literally, I hate that word. L literally, <laughs> I mean, you're the one who said that I look for stories where the truth is stranger than fiction, and so I'm not going to repeat myself a hundred times, but I'm going to say probably four or five more times the next two hours. This is true, by the way, this is true. Uh, it's not based on the truth. It's not kind of a truth. It's not truthy. Like literally as I was losing my identity, I was, a being, I was about to be publicly fired by the New York Times. They were going to run an editor's note, which is basically an article saying, you know, Michael Finkel, the New York Times, cheated on an article and he's fired and he's no longer Michael Finkel, the New York Times. Within 24 hours of that thing being run, no, within two hours of, the, of me being publicly fired, a journalist called me up and I was sure it was- Within two hours? Okay, I mean, crazy. like 90 minutes of this going online. So this is like the timing. I wish that the timing was more believable because I want to like, What's the opposite of a fish story? I want to like light up, like I want to like make it more believable, but I'm just gonna go with what really happened. Like within 90 minutes of my firing being posted on the online edition of the New York Times, uh, my phone rings and a, it's a journalist from the Portland Oregonian, and I'm like, Fuck, I'm gonna have to talk about this firing already. I thought it was gonna be. I thought I have 90 more minutes of peace. Uh, you know, journalists love to eat each other up because uh, that's what we do. And so I was like, I'm gonna get skewered by all the other journalists for being for cheating and for getting fired. And uh, so I remember, I will never forget this conversation. It was with a reporter from the Portland Oregonian. And I was something like, uh, I said, well, congratulations, you're the first to call. And the reporter's like, I'm surprised I'm the first. I'm like, yeah, you're a little bit on the early side. Uh, uh, you know, the story's not running for like, it's not going to press till tomorrow. It's not online for an hour and a half. He's like, what the hell are you talking about? I'm just, I'm not running this till Sunday. And I'm like, you're calling about me getting, fired? He's like, no, I'm calling about these murders. Now, I mean, I literally thought I would never be a journalist again, but I remember like sort of muscle memories were taking over. And I was like, where's the pen? Where's the notebook? What murders? And it turns out that I, just as I was losing my identity as Michael Finkel of the New York Times, literally, this is a true story. Um, <laughs> there was a man 
who ha- was on, by the way, the FBI's 10 most wanted list, wanted for four murders and not just any four murders, the worst four murders you can ever imagine, which is that of your wife and three children, was running around Mexico telling everyone that his name was Michael Finkel. And you have a wife New York and three Times. children. Yeah, I now have a wife and three children. So this is beyond creepy. I don't even like to talk about this, but because your grandfather didn't hear, Ted, I'm talking about this normally. I haven't literally not, like basically say, I don't really feel like talking about this. I've talked it out, but um, I'll give you credit. I'll give you, you know, old school National Geographic shared a tent credit here. Uh, <laughs> so there was, a, there was a murderer running around telling everyone his name was Michael Finkel of the New York Times. So suddenly, like when I thought I would never, like I thought I had 90 minutes to go till I would never write another article again. And this guy just says to me basically, oh, Mike, by the way, you're in the middle of an massive a murder story. You're like kind of like a central character in an explosive murder story. And this, I mean, if it was like a prank TV show, it would have been like too much. Like, yeah. And so um, I never really had a chance to, I never really was fired. I was like immediately like, I need to know more about this. Why did this guy, it, that's, that's the setup. I mean, like in, in what, literature, what? people suggest that the, the, origin of the genre that you're um, an author in is Truman Capote's In Cold Blood, this sort of nonfiction novel. I don't know if you'd agree with that, but it, it seems that that book was pretty um, important in creating this whole genre. True, con- true crime as a novel. We can talk a little bit about that, but here you are, your career you think is over. You're terrified. You're embarrassed. You're oh, potentially people. ostracized from tribe um your your processing i mean it must have been reputation everything everything i have no other skills by the way and i'm not gonna make it as a rock climber you see me (laughs) and this story just appears and you're somehow in the center of it i mean essentially yes um i thought the guy who was impersonating me his name is christian longo i was like i mean i need to talk to this guy uh and the journalist the portland oregonian journalist on the other end of the line he says the magic words which is this guy's not talking to journalists and i'm like i love hearing that because then i'm like okay then i don't have too much competition um i mean essentially the next year of my life was uh devoted to talking to chris longo how did you get um i mean did you just send him a note and he said let's talk i mean how do you How do you approach access? Right, and I was just thinking about timing too. I was actually thinking about you. I went right earlier before we started this. I was like, this is the perfect time to talk to you, Ted. Look, I'm already turning the tables. (laughs) You're, I mean, you can cut all this out, but like right now what's on my mind is like, you're about to be a father for the first time, which is so fraught. Your head is all askew. You could barely pay attention to this damn interview. I'm just running my mouth and you're just thinking, what the hell, how the fuck do you change a diaper? You take the left hand, you lift up the, (laughs) lift up the leg. Okay, so this would be a great time to interview you. And so anyway... I was, I actually had told you that. And so I interviewed, as I learned from this whole Longo thing, that he was being charged with four murders, but hadn't been convicted yet. And that space, that liminal space, that interstitial space, that time when you're unsure of what, of the ground beneath your feet, which you're in right now, uh, is a great time to talk to someone because they almost don't have the bandwidth to bullshit. Mm-hmm. And like, they don't have the time. There's too much going there's on. There's too much going on. There's just like they. So, <laughs> bullshit is a luxury. Oh, this. Where's the t-shirt maker when I need? Yeah. I love that. First, I do the <laughs> I'm sorry. Then bullshit. Beautiful coinage. I'm gonna steal that tomorrow morning. Uh, now we have it unsafe. Yeah. <laughs> Let me just sit with that for a second. Bullshit is a luxury, right? Right. Um. I was. I wrote. This is my. Uh, you know kind of open secret. So how did I get in touch with Chris Longo? I, I wrote a handwritten letter, man, a handwritten letter. It is the greatest tool for me. I'll just speak for myself. I would not encourage any other journalist to ever use handwritten letters because that's my thing. No, uh, I don't need any more competition. But yeah, I mean, even like my mother always made me write handwritten letters, thank you notes to everyone who came to my birthday party from like the earliest age. It's just like, a, like so you've been doing this your whole life. The a handwritten law letter. of, thank you, mom. 
a law of politeness to my mom. Wasn't a text. We didn't have text message at the time. Wasn't a phone call. You pick up a pen. They don't type yeah. it. You write, dear Ted, thank you for sharing a tent with me for two weeks. Uh, I feel like a I feel like a more intelligent person because we spent time together. Yeah. Um, kick ass for the rest of your career. Yours, Mike. That's it. Three sentences. And you put it in the mail. And it makes an impression. You've been doing this. We'll get into some of the other books that you've written, some of the other stories, but every protagonist, every story that you've gained access to with a oftentimes criminal or yeah, the law is involved. Somebody who is very difficult to approach as a journalist. You've done this every time. Do you have really good handwriting? How do you? <laughs> no, I have terrible handwriting really? actually. <laughs> Does I, that... <laughs> I, I mitigate it. But so there's something about writing a letter. So when I'm, anything that you've read of mine, shitty or not shitty is been gone through multiple drafts. It's been sort of polished and maybe even, maybe even overly polished, I'll say, if I can, if I can critique my own work. Uh, but letter, I pick up a pen and I write it. And if I really don't like something, I'm going to cross it out so you can even see that. It's like, it's very raw. It is really, really like pre-first draft. And there's something about that. So it's also going to be genuine. Mm -hmm. And I think that, uh, like what I, the letter I just composed to you in my head was like genuine. You yeah. know, it's like, uh, and so to Chris Longo, it was basically the murderer. It was basically like, oh my God, I can't believe, you know. This is like the the worst murders ever. I was like, this guy seems guilty. You know, four bodies found in Oregon, one live person found in Mexico. I'm like, uh, I you know, can't even hold back for the pen. I'm like, I'm completely baffled by this case, but I'm really curious why you took on my name. And I'm sure there's a lot of things. I just, I'm just overloaded with questions. Let's talk, you know, or something like that. It was so unpolished and so raw, but it it really seems to generate a reaction. There's just something about a handwritten letter that is and, personal. And you kept, um, so you, you formed a relationship. He responded to your letter, I assume, and then? He responded with a phone call. He was in jail and he called me collect from jail. And this led to a visit where the first, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll summarize the whole year uh, fairly quickly. He just basically looked me dead in the eye with a glass partition between us and those old, what you're seeing on TV is kind of true. You were like, is that the last place that actual like old school phones like exist? Is it a jail? And he told me, um, he told me to call my name because he liked, he was my only fan. I have one fan in the world and he's a psychopathic murderer. Take, take him where you get him. Um, uh, but he looked me, I guess I can say dead in the eye, but it seemed like the wrong way. He looked me directly in the eye and he said, Mike, I know how good a journalist you are. I am innocent of these crimes and I will prove it so to you. So he claimed innocence of right course. away. And he said that he would prove it to me. And I had no other work at all, not even lined up. I didn't even have this sold. I mean, it was like, I was just completely on my own, maybe never be able to publish anything again. And I remember looking at Chris Longo in the eye. I was like, prove it to me and I will champion your innocence. Do you think even his using of your name was a clever ploy? Was he, was he trying to use you to work out his own alibi to test and probe with a very a competent and successful journalist, independent thinker. Was he sort of trying to find his way through this whole thing by testing off of you, by bouncing right. and saying, I'm innocent and here's my story. And then you go out and you sort of <laughs> like, well, that doesn't quite make sense. And he's like, ah, Right. And then he changes a little right. bit and then it becomes... Basically, I mean, Chris Longo, may he rotten, lack of peace. Um, he was he is hyper intelligent, which some uh, psychopaths are. And uh, yes, he was... If we, if we had played chess, he was a step ahead of me. Um, he basically... I didn't realize that he was using me to sort of edit his testimony. Like every time I found like a flaw... I was like, look, I, that doesn't make sense. He would be like, oh, thank you, Mike, for telling me that. And I feel a little embarrassed telling you this now. And the way I'm phrasing the story is like, obviously all, all of your viewers are like, you didn't, know what, you didn't know what was going on here? I was also completely, you know, sort of in a weird mindset. Well, but he must have, I mean, yeah, you were in a weird mind, but he, he was probably quite a, I mean, this is commonly the case with psychopath. There's a charm, there oh, yeah. is a charisma, there is a very subtle and nuanced approach to manipulation 
But in retrospect, it seems like that was part of what was going on. Right. Maybe well, not he, all of it, he, but it he, was... Yeah, he read the scene. He took on my name and identity before he... I, before I was fired, in fact, he told me that the reason why he called me up after getting the letter was that he thought in his mind, even though I never said this in the letter, that his use of my name had something to do with me being fired. He didn't, but like I told him, I, w I told him in that first letter, I had just gotten fired and you took on my name and I lost my name just as you, you know, the whole yeah. damn thing. And he was, he's like, I was, he said, I initially called you just to see if I had anything to do with you being fired. I felt terrible about that. He didn't seem to care about the murders, but uh, it was feeling terrible about um, possibly hurting my uh, right. hurting my reputation. So he expressed to you like, "Oh, I'm so sorry that I'm tarnishing your reputation." Or like he's like, "I hope I had nothing. I, I, did I have anything to do with you yeah. being fired?" And I assured him no, but th that was sort of. I just want to say at this point in the story too, because I think it's important for the whole yeah, context lost all the here that the story. this story you wrote a book, and the book became a major Hollywood film. And I mean, Brad Pitt or his production company purchased the rights to this film. Like Brad Pitt's production company took over B, yep. this story and made it a film with Jonah Hill and- James Franco. And James Franco, mm -hmm. thank you. Um, and it's it's a great film, people should watch it. It's really interesting. It's but creepy. This, it's creepy. <laughs> I like this is, I mean, so this is your first book. Your first book becomes a major Hollywood film. Anyway, let, I, I actually, what I really wanna ask is a question about so you're there, you're having this personal relationship with him and he's a psychopath, it seems. And I don't know, maybe that was independently verified by yeah, I mean, I uh, like, psychologists. I don't, I don't like it's, throwing around that term. It's, it's, it's a big word to throw around. Yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah. Um, Psychological diagnoses are- uh, Are a difficult uh, space yeah, to- Yeah, it's a thicket. But, but you, you have a relationship with him, you forge a relationship. I mean, how do you do that? How do you maintain and, and the, one of the reasons I'm asking this, maybe this is an extreme instance of a personality disorder, of a maladaptive personality, um, personality that doesn't fit within the confines of society. But I do think we all have people in our lives who have, it's difficult, you know, there are difficult relationships with, with people. And, and this is a thread throughout your, all of your books. We'll talk a little bit more about The Stranger in the Woods and um, the art thief that you're just coming out with, but you forge relationships with people who are very difficult to form relationships with, who have very few relationships in their life, who oftentimes have um, diagnosed, you know, somewhere on the spectrum of narcissism, sociopathy, psychopathy, potentially. And how do you do that? How do you think about that? How do you approach these people? How do you maintain your own boundaries and your own sense of self and all of that. Right. The reason why I don't like to talk about Chris Longo too much is that I don't think I maintained any healthy boundaries. It's like very hard for me to talk about Chris Longo specifically. The other ones are much easier because talk about the, other the truth of the matter is that uh, a wife and three children were murdered and like um, taking advantage of that in a way. I became friends with a guy who did that. Like that is terrible. But all I can say to anybody is that uh, if you're in a very fraught situation like that, where you don't know what's happening in your own life, it's like you'll grasp at anything. So it was just like, I don't think that I can write about anything like Chris Longo again. It was just too... Uh, I hate the word traumatic, so I'm not. I'm, I'm editing that right out of my vocabulary. I can't think of a a, um, a better one. But uh, there's a there's a very thin boundary between my life and my work. If not, it's extremely porous. And so I take this stuff. Uh, I don't think I don't feel like I'm working half the time that I suppose I am. I'm just being. And so. Uh, Maybe other people sort of feel that also. You take you take it in. You take the toxicity, let's say, in perhaps around, especially around Longo. But like your other two books, um, Stranger in the Woods and The Art Thief, um, Brightweiser and um, Chris Knight. Chris yeah. Knight. They're they're both they're they're not criminal in a. They're not going around killing people. Like their crimes are morally much more gray and ambiguous and, right. and there's a romanticism even to um it a little bit it's like oh yeah is it okay 
to you know, steal some food here and there if you're a hermit in the woods for 30 years. It's like, yeah, that's not really hurting anybody. It's probably fine. Um, Bright Weiser stole for the love of art. There is, you're, it seems like in your other books, after that experience, traumatic for lack of a better word, um, you're exploring the boundaries of morality at edge cases. Yeah, extreme outliers. You're, Always been fascinating to me. Yeah, it's like limit testing. This isn't a thought that occurred to me in reading your books. It's it's like in physics when you know you have Newtonian mechanics. You have equations that that work that govern physical reality in our normal everyday existence, and then they just break down at certain points. You get really fast. You get really small, and and those equations just stop working. And you need entirely different frames of equations, frames of reference, frames of thought to explain what the heck is happening. It seems like what you're doing with your books is you're limit testing social norms. You're limit testing morality as it exists in conventional, normal society. And you're finding these edge cases where there's, um, where, where you're sort of pr probing. You're like, what is moral? You know, where, where is the line? Um, I don't know. How do you think about that observation from reading your books? I love that observation. I'm just sort of sitting with it. Uh, exactly right. I mean, it's like, uh, let me think about what's going through my mind there. That's, I, I love that. Yeah, I've, I'm fascinated with the utter outliers among us because just like you were talking about when you were mentioning physics, uh, when you said that, um, you know, these, these physical, um, these theories break down, that's another way of saying these theories are wrong. Yeah. Right? If they don't work in the edge cases, then they're wrong. They're just an approximation. You know, uh, Newtonian physics is actually wrong. It's just close enough that we can just, you know, let you know what time the sun's going to rise tomorrow, but it actually doesn't work at all. Uh, it's just good enough for, good enough for a human work. Um, and so I, like if someone says a human cannot live alone for a year and I'm like, I found a guy who lived alone for 27 years. So therefore that theory is wrong. And let's mm. just see what the, what the truth is. Like, you know, looking for dark matter and dark energy, you know, we don't know 80% of it. We just pretend that we know what's going on. And so I've been looking for dark matter and dark energy, uh, in my other subjects. Like what's the, like you, it's easy to say Chris Longo, the murderer is just psychopath. When I hear the word psychopath, I'm thinking all you're doing is saying, oh, he's not really one of us. He's not really human, but the truth of the matter is what makes him absolutely frightening is that he is completely human. Chris Longo, the person who murdered his three children with his own hands. You know, it's like, I like want to run away screaming from uh, something like that, but I also really want to look someone in the eye and like get to know that. And it's a, it's an undeniable curiosity and it's creepy as heck, but you know, and I can convince myself, well, if I get to know what one psychopath is, perhaps we can make some warning signs, but so another family doesn't get slaughtered. And that's true. And I'm, it's sort of like a moral straw that I'm grasping on. But the real truth is like, that's something I would tell somebody that I didn't live in a tent with. I would just leave it at that. Like, oh, I'm doing something good. I'm going to let you know, I found out about a psychopath and now I'm going to help you cure them. But that's BS also. The truth is I'm just undeniably fascinated by craziness of many forms and um, that's, I'm still getting paychecks for writing about it. So it's like, uh, instead of being like, instead of like slapping myself, Mike, that's wrong to, no, I'm interested in it. doesn't mean I'm going to steal from museums or murder anybody, but I'm interested in it. And I'm, yeah, I'm leaning, I'm leaning into it. Like, I'm like, I want to know more. I'm going to give, cause we haven't really Sorry. provided the context of yeah. the other two books. I'll just try real quick. So, yeah. um, Chris Knight lived alone in the woods for 27 years. Uh, the longest known um, hermetically sealed existence possible ever in the history. You read like a hundred books or more on hermits and yeah. um, fascinating story of, of an individual who, who just disconnected from society, sort of like Into the Wild, which was made into a book, but that individual only lasts, lived for six months or a year or some, or last some short period of time. Whereas, Chris Knight lived for a right. very long time successfully, was very happy, it seems, or very content to, to just disconnect completely from society. And your latest book, and we'll get into all this in more detail, but your latest book is about the greatest art thief in history, perhaps who stole as much as $2 billion, it's estimated, of art all throughout Europe um, recently, uh, was caught in 2000, 
two or three or four, sometime around then, and and then stole some more art and got caught again. And um, but is <laughs> and you again forged a relationship with this individual and again um, got in into the story, into exactly what transpired through the course of his life, through the course of his crimes dialogue <laughs> even inner inner dialogue to some extent what people were thinking at different points of time while things were happening so those are your three books they're all new york times bestsellers they're all phenomenal they're all very readable each of them i've read in a sitting i mean Thank I, you. they're they're just they're very engaging um okay so that context aside i want to i actually want to ask just one more question about psychopathy and then we'll move off of it. I <laughs> sure. I I um learned at some point, I'm just curious what you think of this, that what psychopathy is, how it's thought of is a different nervous system response to things. So for instance, the the, the best example would let's say be the serial killer who's killed and has like a body in the trunk and the cop pulls them over for speeding or a taillight or something and comes up to the to the driver's side door and the person who has a different nervous system response to threats and fear and things of that nature doesn't sweat from the palm of their hands, doesn't have the normal physiological response that anybody who who has a, a normal nervous system um, would have and that that's what's going on there. I, have you ever come across that? Um, theory of psychopathy or I, I'm just really curious because you've spent time with at least Longo and have thought about some of these things. I mean, this might be a little bit of a left field answer to that, but yeah. um, I mean, we already, like I said, we already know each other. So uh, I'm giving you one level deeper than anything. So when you were telling me about that, yeah. you know, I already er, earlier recoiled about labels and things yeah. like that. I got two competing theories in my head and this might cover this and it might not, which is one that all human beings are almost exactly the same. Like, let's just, what could be someone completely opposite than me? Maybe a, a woman living in the bush, in, a hunter-gatherer tribe in East Africa. So couldn't be more different than me. Well, I've spent a couple of weeks living with such a tribe. And I would tell you that that woman is very much like me. We both want to fall in love. We both want to fill our bellies. We both want to be happy, whatever that means. We both want to sit around the fire and shoot the ship. So we're almost exactly the same. Like, I don't feel like different from them. On the other hand, this is my other, so first, my first theory that guides me around the world is that we're all almost exactly the same, which is by the way, true. We even have like 99% of the DNA of a mouse. So like talk about fellow humans. We're like, literally you'd have to have like five nines past the, you know, 99, you and I are 99.99999% the same. And even a woman living in, with the Hadza tribe in Tanzania is 99.99 the same as me. That's in my mind. And the Hadza, just for reference, are some of the last um, hunter-gatherer right. uh, tribes in, in existence in the world. They've, they've been living the same way for tens of thousands of years or more. Right. And, uh, and, and you went and lived with right. them. We're exactly the same, yeah. me and the Hadza, maybe. So, and I did a whole hunter-gatherer, like sort of obsession for a year of my life. At the same time, we are all... Just, just follow me here for a second. We're all completely different. I love the way we're like divide the world into, I mean, these days it's coming to the fore. Like, oh, are you male or female? No, well, look at that. Every, it's, that's getting skewed. But if you get very granular, if you, if you like get right down to the nitty gritty, there are truly, what are there, 8 billion people in the world? Then there are truly 8 billion different people sexual orientations. No two of us are exactly the same. Are you white or are you black? There are 8 billion different skin colors in the world. They're even identical twins don't have the same skin color. So every single one of us is unique and we're all the same at the same time. So I'm guided by those two competing yet comfortably nested in my head theories. And that allows me to feel comfortable talking to a person who murdered their family or spent uh, 27 years alone in the woods or stole from 200 museums because we're almost the same. We have this sh like 
he wants to fall in love, whatever he wants to be happy, whatever it is. And then we're completely different. So those two things sort of guide me for everything. I'm not sure if I answered your question or no, just it's okay. it's, get, I touched against it tangentially. But yeah, you, like, t- you touched against it. Well, I mean, one of the things you're saying is making me think of a, every fingerprint is different, right? To, to yeah, your point, right, every exactly. single fingerprint. I mean, that's crazy. There's eight or more billion of us yeah, now. And there's not even that many really. Yeah. And if you think about how simple a fingerprint is relative to a brain, um, like a brain is a much more complicated thing right. than a than a fingerprint. Right. If every fingerprint is different, every brain is different. Be really different. Completely different. I mean, yeah. that's a crazy, and it explains a lot Thank about goodness. The, the spectrum of human experience right. and- how, why, why the world is the way that it is. We all have different brains. We right. all are different. And it feels like sort of simple, but it's like, it's profound to me. And so you find these brains that are <laughs> these different. I mean, just at the edge of, of normal, you know, middle of the road society, you go to the extremes, you go yeah. to the endpoints, and you explore. Right. You explore morality. You explore um, personality. You explore story. I mean, you really <laughs> dig into... <laughs> the the depths the trenches of the story let's let's go to the art thief um okay so so i intro the art thief a little bit um i guess i'll i'll ask the question first again how did you reach out to to bright i mean you reached out with a handwritten note i believe but um he didn't get back right away right? yeah this, his name is stefan breitweiser and he's a French art thief born in 1971. So we're not talking about anything historical here. And I had read, uh, I I read voraciously. I like to read small town newspapers. And when I say read these days, it's just go to the website. But uh, I was working on my French and I read a little squib in a uh, French newspaper that basically had like, it was like, journalistic catnip upon journalistic catnip upon journalistic catnip, which was, you know. Do you receive French? Um, news uh, papers? No, I just look at them online. But You uh, look at them online. Like, so you're I, that interested in France because you're living in Bozeman, Montana. Yeah, but time. I just like small town papers and I was like... So are you are you scrolling for small town papers? And I have this image of you with like the the sort of police uh, radio scanner. Trans- yeah. scanner kind of trying to find the story in that way. I mean, there's so many different skills you need to be a freelance journalist and coming up with story ideas is an important one and it's the first one and it's actually i think maybe the one that i'm not the that might be my, the hardest thing for me which luckily is the first step so everything goes downhill from there but uh yeah i mean how do you find a story that's basically your question yeah i mean i have no secret except for uh you need to have a little bit of time. You're not getting paid for finding a story. So that's very frustrating. Like, I'm going to go work all day for no money. It's like, dang, I got three children. Uh, and I know nothing about that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you'll have less time to work and you'll need twice as much money. Good luck. I'll see you in 20 years uh, <laughs> to be continued. You're not going to be able to complete a sentence for 19 years, Ted. Uh, so yeah. Enjoy your last complete sentence. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, sometimes I'll sit down in my computer and I'll be like, that shit crazy story I'll put into Google. Just that's that's like literally my first like search thing. And that's it. See what comes up and spend a couple of hours going from there. And I, But you're I, literally looking at small town newspapers in other countries and other languages. I mean, not yeah. that many people are to that level well, of Thank goodness I don't need any more competition. Yeah. I, uh, <laughs> I mean, with Google Translate, I guess you could read anything these days. You could, you know, it could be a small town in Korea or anything, but this one happened. I was working on my French a little bit and I just read about an art thief who stole from ridiculous quantity of museums, more than 200, uh, non-violently during the day. That's fascinating, fascinating with his girlfriend, fascinating. And then just the thing that was just like journalistic, uh, brain explosion was that he did it for love. He hung them up in his bedroom. I'm like, oh man, that just like spun everything into a totally different category That's of That's the interesting ethical dimensions to this, right? You're exploring what is, uh, <laughs> you're, exp- you're basically exploring concepts of justice, right? When is it? Because there, there are things in the laws um, in the past that you know, we would look at uh, today as brutal. And there will certainly be things 
um, in the laws today that the future will look at as brutal. Like the law is imperfect. And yes. not that stealing art is okay. I mean, it's not, but it, it's a really interesting case study around morality. You just said it's not like it's a blanket statement, but let me uh, not. not <laughs> yeah, go, please. Yeah. Like, do you, I mean, so does the British Museum have to return the Rosetta Stone tomorrow morning? They freaking stole it. Do they have to return the, you know, Elgin marbles? They freaking stole that. What about the Benin bronzes? Those are like the three great. Do the, is that you just said it's not. So I would actually dig into that. I yeah. would actually, I was like, yeah, it completely is okay. Clearly, the greatest museums have just have been stealing art for a while. And it's victorious mushy. civilizations have been stealing from yeah. conquered civilizations yeah. throughout time yeah. in memoriam forever. And during periods of of each world war, art was stolen in every capacity right. so imaginable. So clearly, it's codified. It's okay. We have art in America stolen from the Incas. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's yeah. it, art and theft are intricately linked. Oh, we're just like stealing the. It's one thing to like capture your land and then also you capture your, the thing that you find most beautiful. That's like really damaging to like. So a single person stealing art is it, there's like this quote, it's, it's um, a war, historical war. It's like, if you kill a single person, you're more a murderer. If you kill a hundred thousand people, you're a general. Right. And you get it, really, it's yeah. like, it, it's sort of analogous is what you're saying with respect to art. If you're, if you're a nation state and, and you know, I think anybody listening to this would would think that's wrong, you know, that we stole art from the Incas or that the British stole art from India right, or, right, right. or whatever. But it is historical fact that these things have happened. Picasso stole art. This fascinated me in your book, oh, this story of Picasso, that he stole or commissioned the theft of some really interesting West African sculpture art um, in the early 19th century. Tell me about that. Okay, so yeah, I wasn't trying to condone. I wasn't saying like, everybody go out and grab the thing you like the most next time you see it at a museum. I just like to sort of like, I guess. We're exploring the ethics, yeah. Yeah, which is when you start exploring it. I love the fact that, uh, like you said, uh, the law is a human made um, construction and it's sort of like scaffolding made out of bamboo too. You could like break it pretty easily. Like, the, you know, that's why there's... That's why there's trials and they're never sure how they're going to come out. Um, yeah. Briefly, P Pablo Picasso, yeah. Uh, he saw like this head carved in stone. It's Iberian, actually, not West African Iberian. Okay. Yeah, yeah, where he's from, uh, the Iberian Peninsula, Spain and Portugal. Saw them in the Louvre, thought, I freaking love that head. Paid a scallywag friend of his, Picasso. He was living in Paris at the time. This was like uh, 1919, so early... Uh, early 1900s and paid a guy the equivalent of $10, went to the Louvre, he stole this head, which by- From the Louvre. From yeah. the Louvre. And ridiculously, the way this sculpture, which is a couple thousand years old, was carved, was like the nose was on one side, the two eyes were on the other. Tell me if you're getting an image here. And he put them, he, Picasso admitted this in his autobiography, put the, this, these two heads up in his studio and made Les Demoiselles d'Avignon, which is the, the first, cubist painting basically using these 2000 year old heads as models and then when the mona lisa was stolen from the louvre not long after uh picasso was actually one of the first people arrested for stealing the mona lisa they threw him in a cell for the theft of the mona lisa i mean that's, that's crazy picasso crazy. who was innocent of that but had actually commissioned a theft freaked out and had those two heads returned he never got in trouble for it was he innocent? I mean, it's like, I mean innocent, the, at whatever. the time he was cleared, but it's like, who knows, right? Um, so yeah, I, I mean, I love these like little, that's just like, that just came up in my research and I'm like, I gotta put this. I can't believe that's true. I mean, yeah, yeah, I can't believe the it's invention true of cubism coming from theft, the invention of a genre. Um, and it seems like a lot of the greatest artists, the most notable names historically, are similarly names where their work has been stolen the most. It seems like the act of theft of art elevates the artist, elevates the historical importance of the artist. It seems like it's, it seems like they're feeding each other. I mean, we're all, I mean, I didn't invent the verb and the noun and the adjective and the period on the end of a sentence. I'm just basically stealing from everyone or whoever wrote down the, we're right. all, I mean, you can call it stealing, you can call it borrowing, you can call it uh, appropriation. But Didn't Picasso literally say great artists steal? Isn't that attributed to him? He did say something like that. Uh, I think that's like his quote, great artists steal. 
or steal like an artist. Something to that effect. I wish I had it at my fingertips. We'll have to we'll have to look it up on our uh, our library of congresses <laughs> that, that we so keep. That's so rich because he's literally. I mean, with, yeah, I yeah. agree with that entirely. Or st- you can you, you steal is sort of a you know a, it's a buzzy-ish word, but it's true. I mean, like hmm. I, I I'm just rearranging words. I didn't make up any. You know, I didn't, the dictionary has all the books in it. You just have to find the right order. So, like, you know, it's like, we're all standing on the shoulders of giants, and yeah. someone's going to stand on our shoulders. One hopes. I yeah. mean, that's a compliment. Mm-hmm. You're either going to put us in the dustpan or stand on our shoulders. Yeah. yeah, Picasso ruthlessly, maybe ruthlessly is too strong a word, but copied um, not just the greats, but those around him in his yeah. in his development years yeah. as an artist, and then invented something or you know, forged a genre. I mean, I just think a few minutes ago, I said, I'm stealing that line from you. You know, it's like, yeah. uh, I, uh, all I do is surround myself with pretty, with bright, witty people and just take notes. And I'm like, oh, this is great. There is a book, Steal Like an Artist by yeah. um, Kleinman. I, I'm probably butchering the last name. Anyway, similar to the to the general metaphor that we just used and the, the bright, wiser metaphor that, you know, it's okay for nations to steal large amounts of art, but it's not okay for an individual. There's this idea in steal like an artist where if you're stealing somebody's singular idea like just that idea that feels wrong that feels unethical like hey here's this idea i'm taking it you know let's say like somebody has the idea for facebook and you're like that's a great idea and then you like take it and make facebook but if you steal a thousand ideas and you integrate them into your own being and you generate something from that that's that's okay so similar to all these other metaphors, it's it's like it seems like power in numbers is where the <laughs> where the ethics comes in. Right, I like this is a common theme. I was as you were, as you were telling me that I was like I feel like yeah I mean it would be kind of boring for me to actually like plagiarize from say Hemingway, but like I feel like everything I've written has been plagiarized from Hemingway because he taught me that simple declarative sentences can be profound. So every time I write a paragraph in simple declarative sentences, I'm like you know and you know, thanks Hemingway. Thanks Cormac McCarthy. Thanks you yeah. know anyone else who taught me that. Uh, you know I'm not actually taking the lines, and so I think you're integrating them into yourself, right? And then you're creating from that. And bizarrely, uh, you like talk about linking odd things. So the art thief Stefan Breitweiser, he had this theory that the height of human creativity and therefore civilization was right before machines started stamping everything out, when everything was slightly different and a work of art, including like medical instruments, which he stole, by the way, and, you know, obviously silverware and goblets, they were each one a little bit different. And that was like the maximum human beauty because you took everything all the way down the line from the first person forging, you know, a terracotta cup in a stove in the Rift Valley, you know, 200,000 years ago, up to right before machines started stamping them out for us was a direct line. Right. And he was obsessed with that like most of the art he stole was from what was it late 16th century 17th century 16th, 17th century paintings. end of the renaissance start of the baroque yep just before the industrial revolution right, right the height of human in his theory and i can't i see it i'm not sure if i agree 100 I, mean, I don't agree 100 percent, but i i see it like that was uh, how would he steal how did stefan breitweiser steal 201 times well first of all he had an accomplice which was his girlfriend um, how did he enter a museum? He bought a ticket, paid for it in cash. Don't pay for it with your credit card. And he stole like a David Blaine, like a street, ma- ma- like a street magician. Like he stole, he was, he had an amazing ability to read a room, gauge the limits of a guard's observation, look at security cameras. He would remove, he never wanted to damage a work of art. First of all, he told me that his motivations were much greater than that of any 90, the 99.9% of thieves that steal for money. He was motivated by aesthetic desire. So before he would even think about stealing, he had to actually fall in love with the object that he wanted, which makes like, that makes all the difference. If I'm writing, I could not write a book about a subject that bored me. Um, I just I think I would just, it would just suck. I wouldn't be able to do it. I have to be fascinated. And so just like, just like that Brightweiser had to fall in love with the object. It had to also be the right size. It had to be the right amount of... Uh, he especially fell in love. He was an esthete. He seemed to... There's even a syndrome you talk about yeah, in yeah. the book, but he... It, it wasn't just like, oh, I like that. That looks pretty. It was it was a deep emotional and, and maybe even 
erotic to some extent. Yeah, sometimes. Um, connection to the art. Right. So I'm not a big fan of the late Renaissance, early Baroque. I tend to like more modern art. But if you know everybody watching this, if I said, close your eyes and imagine something beautiful, I think we'll all think of something a little different, whether it's a lover or sunset over the Alps. I can't wait to watch the Persid meteorite shower tomorrow. I love meteorites. They're beautiful to me or a work of, you know, a work of art in a museum. They're all going to be a little bit different, which I love, but that was the thing he liked. It didn't really even matter to me, the subject. I just liked his passion and I applied it to many other things in my life, like working with the world's greatest art thief sort of upped my aesthetic sensibility. So thank you, Stefan, for that. Uh, but yes, he was, he, Brightweiser, like anybody who's good at something, also did their homework. He, Stefan Brightweiser, the art thief, worked as a security guard in a museum. He worked in a frame shop to learn how frames are attached, but really how they're detached. He loved, loved this art. So he stole, when he stole a painting, he removed the frame. He put it at the small of his back. He treated it as one should with an unframed painting, as if it was a newborn baby, he hid the frame somewhere else to break into display cases to steal these objects that we discussed made right before the Industrial Revolution. He wouldn't have to pick a lock. He ingeniously realized that display cases, the edges are all sealed with silicon glue. You take a sharp blade of your Swiss Army knife and you can cut along these edges, horizontal, vertical, like a sort of a surgeon's cut, and pull apart the panels, snake your hand in, pull the object you want to steal. His out methods are so simple, but so sophisticated in the way that humans are sophisticated. It's subtle, it's sleight of hand, it's David Blaine, like you mentioned, yeah. but he could, I mean, you mentioned that y you were in, you were asking him as a journalist in a hotel room, like, how do you do, you, like, you couldn't wrap your head around how someone could walk into a museum in broad daylight. This isn't Mission Impossible, this isn't <clears throat> lasers and, you know, a whole team of security experts. It's like, he would just walk in in broad daylight, there'd be people moving around in the museum. Sometimes he'd be on a tour, and he would just do his thing, take something and move out. I would love to be able to take that iPad, but you would see me. So yes, we were in a like a confined situation like this, even closer together. And you have your iPad there, but I had my laptop basically there. And I'm like, Stefan, I really don't understand how you're able to steal with people in the room. You've explained this to me, but there's just something I'm missing. And just like right now, I really think it's better to main, I, maintain eye contact <laughs> during a conversation rather than you know, look all over the place. Though I did have that whole experience with, with the hermit. We'll talk about that later. Um, and, but I do, so I, I use a digital recorder when I'm interviewing people, but I also have a notebook in my hands to be like, oh, you know, keep spreading his hand through his hair, you know, or just I'll put down things that won't be picked up by a... Uh, a heightened sense of where people's eyes are. I mean, such fleeting moments. Like there's a yeah. point in the book where he steals from a uh, an outdoor art gallery fair, some, something to that effect. And and it, there's enough security there that his his girlfriend is saying, don't do it. Like, this is a bad, this is unsafe. And then somebody else steals something or attempts to, and and people in the crowd are like, thief. And, you know, the, and the security guard, he he sort of intercalculates in a, in a split second that the security guards at the front are going to, are going to move towards this, this commotion and somebody, and then he, and then he takes like a million dollar painting in a split second and just walks out the front. He sort of calculates all of that in right, like he, a half second. I mean, right, he's like a math, you know, or like a chess genius who's like a couple of steps ahead of everyone. Yeah. So when we're interviewing in the hotel room, I, I and I and I said to him, I don't, I don't understand how you can steal in front of people. He looks at me, says, "Well, did you see what I just did?" Yeah. And we're in a tiny French hotel room. I'm like, I did not see what you just did. And he stands up from the little chair he's sitting on. He turns around, and my laptop computer's at the small of his back. And I guess I had lowered my eyes to take a note, and he had stolen it, and then sat right back down, which is why I wish I could take that and p prove it. But I have I have no skills yeah. as you. So he showed me in a hotel room how he's able to literally take something from under my nose, under one's nose, and uh, uh, the story that you mentioned which is also incredible. Just like I, when I think of an art thief, I think of someone like planning a heist for weeks at a time. Literally, he's at an art fair in Maastricht in the Netherlands. That is, he, he's also an art lover. So he just went to take a look and maybe get some ideas for what he might want to steal from museums in the future. Um, he's, he's walking through this art fair and someone screams thief. There's a thief there. And just like you said, like immediately he's like, you know, it's a good time to steal a work of art when someone else is stealing a work of art. I probably would have had to think about this for like months. I was like, oh yeah, that's what I should have done at that moment. Like like in like that moment, you know, he had, he intuited absolutely correctly. He bet a prison term on this, like that all the guards would rush to grab this thief. This thief was tackled, 
captured, arrested. The object that this other thief that Breitweiser didn't know, the piece that he had taken was removed, everything back to normal. And during this commotion, Breitweiser stole a multi-million dollar Renaissance oil painting because there was another thief in the room. So, I mean, I, uh, I, I'm completely opposed to stealing from museums, but I'm completely um, obsessed with listening to amazing tales of daring do like that. Like that is kind of, um, I don't like to use the word genius, just like I don't like to use the word psychopath, but boy, that is kind of a genius criminal like right. move. Right. Um, you start the book with an Oscar Wilde quote. I, I might not get it quite right, but aesthetics are, are higher than ethics. That's it. Aesthetics are higher than ethics. Yeah. I, that encompasses so much of the of the the themes where we're chatting around that that is that's aesthetics are a higher idealized form of of ethics there's a nietzsche quote that you tweeted that um you know if you if you kill a cockroach you're a hero if you kill a butterfly you're um you're a monster or something to that effect and you know and therein lies that the that the morality is intertwined with the aesthetics um and there's plenty of more examples of that how do you think those ideas relate to your the crucible of your own experience as a journalist i mean you're you're in this genre of um nonfiction novel you are um adhering to fact and you have you have fact checkers and you have this past experience that we've talked about where you went on one side of the line and and it was a terrible nightmare of an experience for you and you'll never go there again and you take it very seriously um but it's a fascinating um ethical quandary is like like in some sense the art of the story is more important than what actually happened like in all of human history we tell stories and the most important stories diverge from what actually happened the stories with the most meaning the story that you know, carries with us a lot of times as end up becoming religion. And there's other stories that we make. This is like Yovel Harari, Noah Yovel Harari, like money is a story. A nation state is a story. Like everything is a story. And artistic liberty is taken with stories sometimes. You know, never let a, a detail get in the way of a good story is, I, you know, some other um, quote from somebody a long time ago. It's like, how do you wrestle with the creative tensions of wanting to tell the best story possible, wanting to have the most meaning within the story, wanting to have symbolism and entertainment and all of these things while at the same time adhering to a strict journalistic code. I mean, how do you reconcile with all of those things? I mean, I wrestle with it a little bit. So, wow, there's a lot to unpack in it. I'll try and uh, answer this as succinctly and honestly as possible. So I did have a revelation by being fired by the New York Times, this is almost like freeing, which is that I come into a story with no preconceived notions. I hire two fact checkers. My one fact checker checks the other because the trick of my journalism since being fired is that there is no trick. Like I want things to be, if I'm 99% sure of something, well, it's no choice. I just cut it right out. So like I used to like want a story to feel a certain way. And I actually, maybe the trauma of being fired sort of re release that from my mind like i have no idea like what do, what do you want bright wiser what do you want bright wiser to say i don't want him to say anything whatever he wants to say like what do you like I have, I have no you're not aspiring to convey a certain message i'm more like no i'm like i'm uh just let's just see how it all unfolds which is very relaxing i don't have to worry about shaping anything like i wasn't able to talk to the girlfriend which is a bummer but just tell the readers. I wasn't able to talk to the girlfriend. That's the way it is. And if you're disappointed in that, so am I a little bit, but this is nonfiction. This is true. Uh, so whatever the sort of is unfolding is perfectly fine because that's what's really unfolding. I like this desire to like push or sort of like uh, manipulate was with me when I was younger, like, oh, I hope I, I hope this person says this and that really already taints it. So just that uh, sort of mindset where what? Even that, right. It's like, yes, it actually happened. But, but if, if you're in that kind of mode when you're younger, it's almost like a reality TV producer where you're sort of, you're sort of trying to influence a little bit how someone's thinking, how so, you're playing that game. And so you don't have that 
pressure anymore. But there's, but there's historical. I mean, Capote oh, yeah. came up with scenes whole cloth in, right. in cold blood and that right. invented the genre. I right. Mean, when you mentioned in cold blood to me, the what, what what ran through my head and I let it go because there's so much things to talk about was I don't like the comparison because if I hired my two fact checkers, that book would be ripped to shreds. Like that was actually had lots of fictitious elements yeah. and he I was, do, he was on one side of the, the I, line, yeah. Or more's changed, but I don't have any of that stuff. I don't even like the phrase nonfiction novel because novel implies what made do up. you prefer? Yeah. I don't know yet. I don't like <laughs> I don't even like the word nonfiction. Like why is my uh, form of work defined by what it's not? Like, honey, let's go to not Chinese tonight. Right. You mean Italian? Yeah. Right. Like right. let's I'm gonna wear a not black shirt today. You mean every other color? Yeah. That's what I mean. Like yeah. like let's call it fact or something else. Right. I mean, we need a better name, but non, right. like why is you know, it's right. like my different. brain, I've had the I've never actually said this out loud, but nonfiction or fiction, I always have to, it's like my brain pauses and I'm like, fiction means false, not false. Okay, got it. You know, right. <laughs> like, it's hard for my brain right, right, to process. Right, right. it's terrible. I, I totally agree with you. This is just, this is like an aside rant. We could talk about this, but yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, nonfiction is a terrible name. What do you drive? I drive a not pickup truck. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I could keep going. What are you wearing on your feet? Not slippers. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> totally. Right, good. It's not fiction, totally. it's, tr it's fact. Yeah, politically, ha people have a problem uh, with non-binary. But at like the another... same time that I'm having everything like fact-checked upon fact-checked, there's the other truth. Every single line of every single story is on some level, I was going to say not true, but manipulated. For example, like, uh, like, like your day isn't stealing a work of art. It's like, what'd you have for breakfast? You know, what'd you, you know? Like, there are oh, facts, but interactions oh. are super complicated. Like if, if there's a difficult life situation with multiple people involved, I mean, I can barely, it's like I have my reality, but my reality is subjective and I can't actually even fully appreciate or be inside of the other person's experience or right. lived experience and their reality. And right. it's an incredibly complicated Right. dynamic to even represent what is true. It's right. Like, Marcel Proust writes into a Madeline and writes a five volume book where he basically the subtext of Recherche du Temps Perdu, In Search of Lost Time, Remembrance of Things Past, is basically every, he tried to like capture the moment of biting into a, a, a Madeline and all the stuff that goes on in your head takes five volumes. So yes, like I could have written a thousand pages about what Stefan Breitweiser ate for breakfast and thought like one day rather than any of those crimes. So all I'm thinking, all I'm doing is pulling things out and I'm trying to communicate with my fellow people the outlines of the story in a way that you fill them in yourself. I see. Like, I, I don't know if I actually see. So like, if leave, I, if, leave it to the imagination, which is what good writing does, right? Uh, I mean, that's what I define as writing that pleases me, but other people like maximalist, other people like other things. It's, mm -hmm. it's a very, like when you start breaking down communication into like its elements and like, I'll get, I'm actually getting a little nervous right now because it seems like an impossible thing to do. In some sense it is impossible. Yes. Right. And so you're just like doing a couple of sketches here and no matter what, 20% of people are just going to dislike whatever style you have. So you have to just get like, But in your job, I know we're like really digging into, I just find it fascinating. I've been really thinking about, you know, what is truth in story? How do you, like, for instance, in your stories or in the genre in general, you know, there is the creation of the kinds of things, the kinds of techniques that exist in a novel, which is conversation or dialogue, third person, where, you know, you as the writer wasn't there. Right. So you're creating that. And then even one step further than that, I mean, you're fact checking that, you're trying to discern who said what, what actually happened. But then there's there's inner dialogue too, or what somebody felt or what somebody thought about something as it's happening. That's even even more abstracted from, um, you know, hard, cold, one plus one equals two. I right. mean, how do you, <laughs> and that's kind of the, the genre, that's the um, space that the genre is filling and it's, and it's an awesome genre because it's like there is something about reading a very a true story that is that is scintillating that is engaging you know it's like why movies that can do it put based on a true story at the end because because you're like cool and that might be even looser than uh, is looser than what you're doing what the genre aspires to do but but how do you think about these techniques how do you aspire to the highest standard that you can aspire to what do you how do you do it Right. So I think just breaking down your question is like, what's the creative process like? How does the yes. magic happen? 
And I mean, the more you describe it almost, the less, I mean, the, the short answer is, I don't know, but I do have, I told you I like to practice telling my stories orally. Yeah. And then when I'm writing poorly, but like getting my first, I mean, I write multiple drafts. I, I, I do have this image that comes to my mind of the dude at a soundboard at a concert with a million dials in front of them. Like, man, every time I see those dials, I get like a weird reaction because I actually feel this a lot where there's so many of them that you can turn. Mm. Like if I was to describe what, like, what are we talking about tonight? There's like a million little things you can emphasize this and that. And so I'm trying my hardest to sort of put, like deal with all those dials. And then this is even the hardest step. I have to achieve this sort of mindset of the word that comes from is looseness as opposed to tightness. Like when I'm thinking about all these things, I'm very tight. Looseness and be like, well, fuck it. I'm going to shape this in a way that feels right. So I've taken the whole sound dial thing and then just start like yeah. picking out a moment. It's I craft. I guess so. It all feels like, it all feels like, uh, I, li I like it. It's like a very, it's a very difficult puzzle that's never quite solved. And then of course, like, you know, each sentence could be good, but then you read the whole thing. You're like, oh, there's too many, the parts are greater than the sum. And then I'll like pull out sentences that are great on their own, but just sort of don't fit in the whole. And so there's a lot of things going on, but it's, I find it awesomely challenging. Mm -hmm. and somewhat frustrating, but also I even like the frustrations. If it was easy, I would think it would be boring. The amount of work ethic you throw at it, the persistence. Yeah. I mean, I heard in a different interview you gave, you, t you described, um, you know, your, your block of granite and ch chiseling mm -hmm. away at it. But like in each of these books we've been discussing, you read hundreds of books, you know, you read hundreds of books about art history and art theft. You read hundreds of books about hermits of the past. I mean, you... Yeah you immerse yourself and you take many years to write these books and you throw all of your being with hard work ethic and persistence at understanding the story and the space and the genre and the all of it so comprehensively and then you you chisel and you chisel and you chisel and you chisel and you end up with something that's enjoyable and engaging yeah inefficient and i would like like i like i think i said at the outset I would like to know what other writers are doing, but yeah, I mean, I love reading. And when I get into a subject that I like, like I found it enjoyable to read a hundred, like a hundred books on art theory and art stealing. And then, you know, as I, as I tell my wife, she's like, uh, I, I was like, if I can average one for each book I read, if it adds one line, one line, one sentence to my book, that's good. That's good. That's the ratio. But, that's such a high bar. I, mean, I know, but I've been with National Geographic photographers who take like 50,000 photos and nine get printed. Like that that's is the literally ratio less than and, like, like, like one in a thousand or, you know, one in 500. So you've borrowed that bar from the photographer and it, it's a good one. I mean, I've been a photographer for a lot of years yeah. and that is, you know, I, I, I think I have 400,000 photos in my catalog right. and, you know, I'm quite happy about 50 of them. Yeah, that's not a bad, that's not bad. But our pursuit as humans is to make it simple, is to make it, a, to make these abstract, everly, infinitely complicated things into something that is, that consecrates as a thing, like a book or a photo, right. or, you know, that can then be enjoyed by others, that can be appreciated, that can be Right, I think understood. you touched on, on something important where like, I strive, no, I don't know what I achieve, to make the book, the story feel sort of, simple without for a second saying that this is a simple story. At the same time, it should be fairly easy to read, enjoyable, short, declarative sentences, but never for a moment pretending that this isn't profoundly complicated and every sentence could have been a thousand other ones. So all these things sort of go through my mind while I'm talking to you. And li literally, I know it feels all like, I feel like maybe other creative people, and probably you will say that, but I'm really serious about how do I achieve like this sort of, it's like I, I meditated for 10 days. I'm the worst meditator on planet earth and I hated it, but it was this, this sort for of- for a magazine story? It was for myself, for but I did write about it. Yeah. But there's this equanimity that they say, you know, just like, don't, you know, like when you're meditating, don't think about, oh, I'm having a great meditation that you've already ruined yeah. it. So like, I try and find this sort of, uh, oh God, I, I don't like the phrase Zen state. This is why it's better to be a writer. Like you can always like have a second and third and fourth and 11th draft. 
And sometimes I'll back it off too. It's like sometimes too polished. I don't want it to be, you know, all these things I could break down. And like, but if I really sat there thinking like about each sense's greater meaning, I would just break down and it, would, it wouldn't happen. There has to be like, I don't even like the expression flow state and Zen this, but it's all somewhat true or all sort of, you know, the creative state is, uh, it's lovely. It's wonderful. Like I, it's rare to achieve. And I think that all creative people, yourself included, can feel it from time to time, this sort of like creative energy. I did get it for the last draft of this book, which was great. The first uh, 10 and a half years were just a grind, but those last couple of months were just, no. <laughs> I actually I actually rewrote my entire book in the at the last several months of this. I wasn't, I was like 92% happy with it, which isn't good enough. And, uh, even my own, I don't even know if I've ever talked about this. Even my own editor was like, this is good. We can publish it. It was just something. No, no, I know it was. I had a couple of very good friends that said like, by the way, you need to have good friends like this who rather than said good, 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 said something like, that's not your best, Mike. Mm. That's not really, I feel like you're missing something. And just told it to me, honestly, while it was time to change it. And it really hit home for me. And like uh, my own editor. I mean, I, I write for money. I have three children. It's like, I, you know, I, he was like ready to pay me. And I was like, oh my God, I should just like hand this in. And I was, uh, I was like, I need some, I, I'm going to rewrite it. And I thought I would just do a light rewrite literally from my second to last draft of my book, 200 pages to my current one, not one paragraph remained the same. It was like, I pulled this thread in the entire sweater that I was wearing was just like dangling there. I was like, fuck it, now I gotta re-knit this thing. And it was better. And I got in this incredible flow state that is so rare, like once a decade rare. And I, I mean, I've been married to the same woman, Jill, for 19 years. And so I was like, Jill, like I got it. She's like, go. And I, I was drinking coffee like a mad person, often coming home from work at eight in the morning, having gone at eight at night and just like 12 hours, complete flow state, sleep until my body is exhausted, drive a couple of kids to, to school and to practice and then go drink a whole bunch of coffee and like see if I could replug into that flow state. And I had like this six week, amazing, amazing sort of creative wow. wonder. And I rewrote the whole book and I'm like very happy with it. Now it's like, it was like made all the difference to me. That's amazing. So if you and any of you out there can achieve it and you have like the right life, you know, it's like, I understand that most people like have to get to work when their boss tells them to not like, Oh, but I, you know, midnight, yeah. whatever. When I feel like it. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, I, I realize all the luxuries are attached to it, but that achieving that amazing uh, creative state is just, it's rare and it's great. It's wonderful. Like where all the inner critics have been silenced and there's no outer critics yet. And you're feeling, yeah. You worked on it for 10 and a half, 11 years. Yeah. Yeah. Not full time for 11 years. I had a whole, I wrote a whole, the whole hermit book in the middle of it. But my first, when I first stumbled across the, uh, the little French article, um, entrefile, there's a French word for like a little squib article. Uh, um, when I found, when I first read about Stefan Breitweiser and put, wrote him my first letter to today is like 12 years. So the book came out. Yeah. So it's like, and that was also going to say something to you about that, which is, I mean, I have all these luxuries of time. I'm trying, I'm, I'm writing little articles in between to keep, you know, my kids in uh, Cheerios, but, uh, <laughs> but yeah, the, the time is a wonderful asset. If you can use it, the fact that we've known each other for more than a decade makes me talk to you in a different way than if I had just met you, honestly. Yeah. Like, I feel like once you share a tent with someone in a weird situation, then I mean, you see me in my underwear. So it's like, <laughs> you may have seen my little, my little cock and balls. And it's like, uh, it's like, dude, I got nothing to hide from you now. And so like it changes things. And so um, I wanted to achieve something like that with all the subjects of my book. And so if they're like, I need a year before I talk to you again, I mean, what daily newspaper reporter would be like, no, you got, you got nine minutes. And then I got a deadline. Like I, I yeah. take advantage of time and the elasticity of it and the depth and the, and, and the, you know, the first 10 hours of interview, I probably all throw out. And it's like, once we get to our 11th hour of interviewing right here, we're going to get to some good stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, well, there is something See that the compounding nature of time in terms of, well, I mean, financially it's how that works oh, in the it's stock a market. Financial nightmare, but, but yeah, right. For a creative person. Yeah. But, but quality, quality of, 
craft, quality yeah. of artistic pursuit. You know, it, it, people underestimate what they can do in 10 or 20 years, respective to what they can do in a year. We, we're, it's non intuitive. This compounding quality of time is really unintuitive to most people, to, to me too. Yeah. I mean, and then there's people out there that write a book every year and it's freaking great. And I'm like, I guess as you get older, you're like, I'm sure I'm jealous of those people, but uh, you do get, I think as you get older, you do get a little more, you, one should at least get a little more comfortable in one's own skin. Yeah. And so where I was like, when I was younger, I'd be like, I got to learn how to do it. I learn how to write a book like, you know, yeah. David Grant in 18 months. I got to da, da, da. Yeah. And now it's like, ah, it's just sort of doesn't work for me. Yeah. Which is like a more comfortable. It's your craft. It's your process. But it, works, you know, and it's, I know hooker by crook, you know, it's all a Rube Goldberg machine, a bunch of, you know, bobby <laughs> pins and chewing gum is holding the whole, the whole machine together. I'm sure. <laughs> but the outcome, the book, you know, the, that's what matters in any artistic pursuit. Right. I agree with you. It's, you know, it's the, it's pressing publish. It's the end result and all the things you have to do to get there. And everybody has a different process. And, right. You know, your books are your book. Like you could remove your name. To, to me from a book, you, somebody, a, a random friend could send me a thing. And, and if your name was removed and I didn't know, and I started reading it, I'm pretty sure at some point my brain would be like, did Mike Finkel write this? It must be some word or something that I use all the time. No, I, I, I really appreciate that. And I don't set out to do it that way. I think if I did, uh, then it would be worse in a way. Like, I haven't chat GPT do things like right in the style of Mike Finkel. <laughs> By the way. Let's talk about that. I yeah. mean, what I want chat GPT to do, so I, I, I've been on it twice. I, went, I asked him two things. First of all, I wanted help with sports gambling because I really like to gamble on sports and I'm terrible at it. And so <laughs> it didn't help me at all. And then second thing is who fucking cares if chat GPT could write like Mike Finkel? I could write like Mike Finkel. What I want chat P GPT to do, please open up and say, write 10% better than Mike Finkel. Then I'll be thrilled. Like, yeah. like, I don't want to be like, oh, oh, that's better. Like, right. It's so far as it's like, an approximation know. machine. I just wanted, I just wanted it to be better than me. Like who, like, what the, like right 10% better than Shakespeare. Like I'm ready for the better. Do you think it'll maybe in slow incremental ways, but do you think it'll um, replace journalism? And, and I can be more specific. Like I, I worked at Bloomberg at one point in my life and Bloomberg has, in, in a financial market sense, you know, immediate um, news article, you know, some company publishes quarterly earnings and I don't know how they figure this out before AI, machine learning or something, but it would be, you know, company X posted blank, you know, percentages, here's what it means, here's what analysts thought, here's where it actually hit, you know, within a second of, of a quarterly release, there was that level of journalism automated um, but I mean, with AI, it's like president gives speech at white house and couldn't AI, you know, <laughs> say <laughs> president gave this speech, you know, here's what Republicans think. Here's what Democrats think. Here's what it means. You know, and it's just kind of all, it's all kind of good enough for that level of, of immediate consumption of, of facts and information. I mean, it <laughs> What are your thoughts on just like the encroachment of AI into our world and into journalism? You know, it's like, I mean, what's that old cliche? It's like the, you know, the buggy whip industry, you know, you might as, it's like, I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I cannot imagine a time in which we wouldn't want to swap stories with one another. It seems like the most core element of the human condition the evolution of story. I mean, our ability, even as a species, Homo sapien, to essentially win over Homo erectus or Neanderthals who were bigger, a lot bigger and stronger, is predicated upon our ability to share story and communicate. And it, it just seems so core to our being. Right. I, and I'm not even, I can't disagree with any of that. So like, yeah, we like to share stories with one another. So therefore, weirdly enough, I am not at all concerned about the future of journalism. What the, you know, if, if you're like, I am a man with a pen and a notebook that's going to write for National Geographic Adventure magazine, that's too specific, then, then you're fucked. But like, I really truly believe that we're going to swap stories with each other. And if, 
I mean, if I could press a button and it's going to write my book for me, then I'm going to get a lot more mountain bike. You did. I mean, it's like, I'll just see how it all plays out, but I feel not uh, depressed because if, if, if I felt like, oh my gosh, the future, we're just not going to share stories with each other. Then I would feel like, oh man, journalism is in, in trouble. But just like you said, I have, do not envision that at all. What do you think about impersonation and AI? Like I, I had an experience recently that um, kind of blew my mind, which is I almost got entangled in a, in a cat, in a fraud, in a catfishing kind of thing where somebody who is a notable National Geographic photographer, uh, I thought was reaching out with, with their name at gmail.com. And it seemed, yeah. it seemed legit. And it was, and I'm, I'm on the Nat Geo Adventure Instagram roster. Like mm. sometimes I receive emails from National Geographic with requests for proposals. Right. And this was exactly in the style yeah. of that. And it was requesting an application with some amount of portfolio and information to to apply to go um, to New Zealand to do a photography shoot on climate change with this other national. And I've been on some National Geographic mm -hmm. projects. We were on one together. and. Uh, and I was busy. We were, there's just a lot going on. And so maybe I didn't put enough um, thought or scrutiny into it, but I'm just like, oh, okay, this is just something I have to do. I'm just going to put this application together. And and then they're like, you're accepted. Congratulations. Yeah. And I'm like, wait, what? And, uh, and I'm excited at first. And, and it pretty soon thereafter starts to become clear to me that something's not right here. And that sort of culminates in and if it turns out to just be an obvious fraud, which is them, they they were sending me a cashier's check to cash to pay for flights or, you know, the cashier's check would have bounced. But basically it was an elaborate fraud, but it seemed to know precisely about me and it seemed to know precisely how Nat Geo communicates, how it organizes a PDF, what the language and the formatting. And and I cu it couldn't escape the idea that AI and ChatGPT was involved some here in approximating what things look and sound like. I mean, even your story just made me interested in like who's behind that. I really like con artists and <laughs> many other criminals. Like it, I can almost see like a good thing that you got to, I mean, if, it depending upon your, where you are in your work and creative life, life I'm like, who's the, who sent that to me? Like, you know, right. I've, I've actually, I've been, I mean, if you're the type of person who has never gotten a little bit scammed, then you just don't have enough doing in your life. Cause you know, <laughs> I, I, you know, not very long ago when I was living in France, there was this, uh, the, the, the French post office had this thing where you owe 15 cents postage and we can't deliver it. And I was like, 15 cents. And I filled it all out. Shh, went about my business. Like went back to it. I was like, Oh, that's a scam and had to cancel my credit card. I was like, yeah, of course I was a scam. I just looked at, you know, I, I was distracted this and that, but also just like, you know, you want your good con artists to be good. Like, uh, I'm not pretending that I'm going to outthink everyone. Like, you know, you sh yeah, I, I'm, I, maybe as you get old, you sort of like understand, I'm going to be the victim of a couple of more scams in my lifetime and I'm right. going to doff my cap because I try to be uh, aware of it, but uh, that's not, I'm not spending my whole life trying to set up someone for a, like mm -hmm. that's someone's profession to, or whatever. That's their job. Or a group of people. Yeah, or... yeah. I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to outthink everyone. I'm going to get snagged. I just hope it's a... Uh, you know, not too devastating, but I mean, just yeah. like, yeah. So I try to like, so much shit is coming at us at all times in all directions. And that I, you know, I really am like pushing, absorbing it all, thinking about a lot of things, but also trying to just bob in the sea of everything where you're like, can, you know, can you be present? And I'm really hoping that you're able to do this quite soon. <laughs> like I do, it's not, it's indelibly etched on my mind having children and stuff like that, where you, you know, I hope that you're able to pick up your son and be like, not be like, I have a deadline, this is that, where it's like, you're like, look at this little lump of clay here. You know, it's like, you yeah. try to, it's very hard to be present. Mindfulness is hard being perfect on, yeah, I'm, I'm soon to, be a father and yeah. it's, it's really exciting. Um, and emotional availability and presence is, you know, of all the baby books. And it's crazy how soon becoming a father brings to the fore so much about your own upbringing, your, your parents, your life, every, everything is kind of, cause you start examining it all from a different light and you start thinking about things in a different way, at least for me. And, um, and and that's the one resounding um, truth that I hope to aspire to with a kid, which is being emotionally present, being there, just as you said, like that is 
it. You know, if I can achieve that, um, you know, that'll be great. Uh, but it's very hard to do, right? I'm not too worried about you. Look at this. Now I'm feeling more comfortable because I'm about to like I have all these things for you. <laughs> now I'm now I'm starting getting in my comfort zone. Yeah. I'm like, oh, you asked me all those questions. Let me, you know. No, uh, I think that I'm not worried about you achieving the right mindset. There's just something like I can't wait till you see like what other things unfold. I think way harder than that is to, and this might take, I think for boys, especially, I think women might be better at this, but like you're, it's going to take between one minute and 25 years for you to understand that you are no longer the most important person in your own life. Right. Like if someone came in here, I don't know why this came to my mind, shooting, not an impossibility in the United States of America, you would hide behind that chair. Now, if I was your son, you would dive in front of the bullet without even thinking about it. You would like, this is why that whole killing your own children thing was like crazy, but like you would just like your second, like I would in an instant, in an instant without even thinking about it, like take a bullet for my, to protect my children. It's like crazy. You wouldn't even think about that. For you, I'm probably hiding behind the chair. I mean, it's just, or it just wouldn't be instinctual. I'd have to think about it. Uh, and so like you're number, you're gonna be number two in a couple of weeks in your yeah. own life. And that is a cool, fascinating, hard to grasp change. And so- And really healthy. I mean, yeah, I, I, I think I it's think really, so. I'm, I think so too. I'm really excited for that. I as think so a, too. As a human who, you know, has definitely at times put myself at the, at the center of the, you know, main character, right? It's like, oh, you're of course, living your life and of that's course, of to course. some degree what everybody does, but, but maturing and becoming, you know, a fully formed adult is, is in part subjugating your own primacy to, to a, a child and that's and if, maturity and that's really healthy. I agree with all those things and let's even expand that outward. Like if you handle everything correctly, I think the things that you think are selfish, like you're like creating this show, yeah, will get better because rather than you thinking that this is the most important thing in the world, this is the second most important thing. Like you have more important things now, which yeah. gives you this, I'm just telling you, it's made me a more creative, like, like weirdly, because I always think of writing as the most selfish thing, but weirdly the fact that I'm now number four in my own life and maybe my wife and I are even, so I'm number four in my own dang life. I'm not even one, two or three anymore. I don't even get on the metal stand. Uh, <laughs> has like, oh, you know what? The, it, it, that book is actually my, my art thief book. I'm happy about it. It's not that important. Mm. And like, I can't believe it when an editor says to me, you know, Oh, I know that uh, cutting your words is like killing your babies. I'm like, oh, absolutely is not at all like that. Right. I actually have babies and you can cut the shit out of these words. And they're, you know, it's not, you know, it's like, right. these are not my children. I have children. And it's so not it's even like, close it's, to it's that. It's freeing. Yeah. It's good because you're like, if you think that th your book is the most important, precious, or your TV show or your podcast or your vlogcast, whatever we're calling this, uh, is the most important thing in the world, that's just too much. It's, it's going to make it worse. Yeah. I kind of like that. So I agree with, so yeah. this is what I'm giving you optimism. Like you're going to be completely overwhelmed. You're going to be number two in your own life, but it's going to, it might make you a better artist. Right. It's beautiful. I hope so. Let's, let's uh, talk about, yeah. what do you want to talk um, about? Stranger in the woods for, for a sec. Um, at one point in the conversation, you were talking about, um, a 10 day meditative retreat. Um, I, I can't imagine not saying a word, or I think you wrote, he wrote, he said one word in his 27 years, he said hello to somebody. <laughs> I mean, most people would think that connection to other humans is essential for mental health, is an essential element of the human experience. Um, what are your thoughts on spending time uh, with Mr. Knight and how does, how does that all work? I mean, so the stranger in the woods did a nutshell is about a man named Christopher Knight, Chris Knight, who spent 27 years living all by himself in the woods of Maine and to feed himself broke into, um, unoccupied cabins and stole food, clothing, reading material, but lived completely by himself for 27 years. And you're totally right that for the most part, humans need connection. People that are in solitary confinement literally go crazy lose their mind. The harshest penalty we have. Yeah, it's, it's 
you know, it's like there are people that would prefer the death penalty than to be, I mean, I couldn't imagine being sealed off in a supermax cage. And luckily, I don't, don't have to experience that, although I would like to experience it for a week just to see what it's like. Uh, so he's such an outlier. He goes against the Chris Knight, the, the hermit, goes against so many of the things that we take as sort of essential to human life, like connectivity and things like that. But again, he's human and pushing the edges. And I'm actually fascinated by people, great religious leaders, meditators, like people who get to know themselves. I have a theory, this applies to fatherhood too. It's my reason why I go powder skiing a lot. Uh, sometimes I just choose to believe a theory rather than questioning it. And so I totally believe that if you are satisfied with yourself, if you are happy with yourself, you will be a better father. I believe that. To make myself happy with myself, Jill, my wife, are you listening? I need to ski powder. So uh, so I, I ski, all good? Yeah. I, so I, 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 that's why I have to go, if I don't ski powder, then I won't be happy with myself. If I let other people ski it up, then I will be a bad father. You know, I believe all that stuff. And whether or not it's true. You need to take care of yourself before you can take care of others. Kind of. You need to lead yourself before you can lead others. Or the more satisfied you are with yourself, the better father you're going to be. So there's there's the, there's that. So, uh, you know, uh, so Chris Knight, the hermit, is like, I was, I cannot exactly explain what fascinated me so much, but it was just this outliery thing. And the fact that Chris Knight was happy or he found contentment being completely alone. He seemed happy to you. He seemed content. He was the content. It was the, it was the situation that worked out best for Chris Knight, the hermit, just to be completely alone. And he was arrested, breaking, stealing food and put in jail. And so like literally the person who spent his entire life trying to be by himself was like locked in a cage with another person. And I just was fascinated by this whole scenario. I saw a lot of aspirational, like I wanted to be able to be by my, alone with myself, uh, which, which a writer does, but I don't really feel like I'm alone with myself when I'm writing. I'm actually thinking about another subject. I'm not, it's completely different than meditating. Uh, you know, I took this 10 day meditating. Um, I went uh, on a Vipassana retreat. 10 days is a uh, standard where you take a vow of silence, but there were other people around, but you really do meditate alone. And I found it it was terrible for me. I freaking torture. I'd rather really, uh, rather like right away, hour uh, two, you're you're dying. Uh, the whole thing didn't work for me. I'd rather crawl naked through glass what in a war zone. <laughs> <laughs> okay, back to Chris Knight and the hermit. Yeah, and the hermit. I mean, okay, you went and lived in his encampment. Um, for a time, right? Yeah. I, I, so I was, you know, the story really appealed to me. I'm fascinated by the idea of exploring your inner, as um, Thoreau said, your your inner Atlantic and Pacific Ocean. I mean, like, really, when you get right down to it, like, we we're talking about how important it is to connect with someone, but you can never really know someone else. Like, I've been with my wife for 19 years. I, I cannot... I cannot know her entirely. I don't know what's, that's just a fact. We don't know anybody else. So we're all locked in our own heads. So it's sort of like to know yourself sounds both selfish and essential. That's the only person you really can know. And if you're a curious person, like a journalist, then the, the inner depths, the only reason I've been writing about other people is just to avoid like looking into myself. And uh, maybe I used a murderer, an art thief, and a hermit as my therapist. A little bit cheaper form of therapy. There are elements of yourself, shadows of yourself, perhaps, yeah. that, that you resonate with in these characters. Right. And I, I was just fascinated by this whole idea of someone who's completely, not just comfortable, but that's the only thing they want to be is by themselves. Chris Knight was certainly an introvert. <laughs> yeah, we... He didn't, he never even got to like me, <laughs> which is funny because I, my subject basically despised me. No, that's too much. My subject did not want to talk, be talking with me, but realized by the, um, he was super intelligent by the machinations of game theory that I, I think 500 journalists bothered Chris Knight to get his story. And I feel, thank you, Chris Knight, that he'd selected me to, to speak with. But I think he, he was a super intelligent guy. I think game theory in his head was like, if I don't tell one person, I'm going to get bothered for my entire life. So I'll, I'll pick the least odious person to talk to and I'll tell 
my, my story. And then the minute he was finished telling me a story, I was like, Hey, we're friends now. He's like, I never want to see you again. And we have never spoken to each other since our last conversation. Not once. I promised Chris Knight that I would not bug him. And I made him promise me. I remember this vividly, the last moment we ever saw each other. I said, Chris, he's like, yeah. I was like, Hey, if you ever want to get in touch with me, would you send me a letter? He said, yes. And he has never sent me a letter in seven years. You set the rules of the road. <laughs> yeah, which is fine. I kind of like, again, theme of the day. I like the fact, am I curious about what he's up to? Oh yeah, absolutely. But I revel in the fact that I don't know that. Like mysteries are great. So I, I, mean, I was talking about religion and stuff. I, I, I like mysteries. Don't, don't answer everything. Do you stay in touch with Stefan? So this is just a brand new book. I mean, I went to his last trial was in March of 2023. So now we're in August. So like that's five months ago, I went to one of his trials. So he's still, you know, he's in the French penal system. So this is not a completed, concluded relationship. Uh, and I think there will be a movie made out of this book. And so, yes, I'm still in touch with Stefan Breitweiser, the art thief. And his last trial, I thought, oh man. So what happened before he even went into the courtroom was that a Swiss camera person stuck a television camera in his face and he there was like a altercation i think he spit on him and then there was fighting i was like oh my god he just hates all the journalists and so i like kept my kept my distance and then uh during the lunch break i said hello to him and he was completely warm i was like i had no idea he's like huh. oh good to see you there was the whole covid thing like sort of forced separation so i hadn't seen him in a couple of years so i have a decent relationship with the art thief but i'm not writing to him like there's been like two emails and the last year i sent him my book uh he basically said i looked at it but i can't really read english there's going to be a french translation you know there's like uh so um yes i have a, a my goal in my goal in reporting is not to have a warm relationship with the subject it is to write a story that i feel is both true and emotionally true at the same time which is like factually and emotionally true and yeah. i believe that i yeah, if you hate the book, I'm not like not. I'm going to be hurt. It's going to hurt me a little bit, but not that deeply because I feel satisfied with the project. Flawed project, but a but a flawed uh, creator of the project. You know, it's like you mentioned. There's already potentially a movie in the works it's so around visual, it. It's about an art thief. There's a great movie. I, I mean, Have people reached out. I mean, is this? Is oh this my a goodness! If I had a dime for every. Uh, uh, producer that's reached out, I'd have like $75. <laughs> <laughs> that's a lot of producers. <laughs> that's like 750. Yeah. <laughs> well, you've already, I mean, your first book became a major movie and this now, I mean, it, there's a, there's a, there's a model here that you're in some ways, maybe not, maybe not innovating, but you're very consistent with and is a great model for a writer. I mean, it's certainly better than being a magazine writer, right? I mean, now magazines are really... I'm just going to call them dead. I mean, it, yeah. it breaks my heart, but uh, I mean, they exist in a different way. As we talked earlier, like, you know, I feel like the future of journalism is strong because we want to tell stories to each other, but the specific future of like actual magazine, when I think about the word magazine, it's always on paper. I don't think of a online magazine as a different beast, but like actual living, touching magazines. I still subscribe to a ton of them, but it's amazing to me that they still exist. I think even National Geographic will probably be all online pretty soon. I think it is. They killed. They killed the yellow book, um, or maybe they officially announced it, and it's I've still got a few issues my, yeah. left. But it, they they closed the publication of it. Does that hurt me? I mean, like I said, I try to like I try to be more observant. Like I, you shouldn't publish something. Shouldn't kill trees to print something just for tradition. Like, obviously, uh, I mean, this is all like a bunch of cliches. Like, you know, <laughs> the only constant is change. It's like, yeah, like nothing's, you know, it's, it's... As a photographer, it hurts me because that magazine especially is so iconic and important yeah. visually for photography. It is the gold standard. It is the top of the top of the class. For that to just no longer exist, I mean, that... <laughs> unfortunately speaks volumes for that style of photography as well. And things will go digital, but even that, it seems, whether it's photography or writing, you know, if you're, if you're digitally writing for National Geographic or others, um, I mean, compared to writing books and having them be sold off as movie rights, it's like 
there's no comparison there in terms of trying to make a living. And I would assume being fulfilled in that practice too. I mean, that I would assume is more fulfilling to to dive into that pursuit and and then be rewarded with with the world saying, yes, you know, we want this. We want to make this into to more media and to more content. And that must be gratifying. Right. The thing I was thinking of that uh, it's a little more nuts and boltsy, but so I I mean, I'm feeling old, but I grew up writing for print magazines that are finite. And so it was very like, this was a big thing in my whole writing career, which was how much space do you have? And like, you know, oh, you have 2,500 words. Shit, we just sold an ad. Now you have 2,100 words. And there's never, you never run out of space on the internet, which is weird. So I believe that a generation, now I found, sound like a crotchety old man, but I believe that a generation of writers are growing up uh, not having it drilled into them to be pithy and short. And it's like, so part of me, like almost everything you read for me is pretty dang tight. Yeah. And that's because that's the way I, I believe that to be the most, like people are busy. And I feel like that sort of skill is like, I don't really care what m method, like if we all had a iPad or something, that's fine. It's like, uh, you can read any way you want. We're all going to tell stories. But I think that if it makes you a sloppier writer, like- But you can be a great writer and be like, I mean, Tolstoy wouldn't have fit in a magazine, right? Like, it never no, they would have serialized it. I mean, that's basically, I mean, <laughs> that's what, um, uh, that's what Dickens, uh, almost all his books were serialized but in a weekly. So yes, you're right. You don't have to be, but um, I don't even think Tolstoy or Dickens were just like uh, overlong for the sake of it. Like, sure. I think they it's were good. fitting enough in to convey the proper context of the, you know, in Tolstoy's case, you know, France and Russia and the times and the wars and the, it, you know, it needed all of that to convey the, to convey the infinite complexity of what's going on. Right, right, right. <laughs> I, what you're saying is reminiscent of the entire idea of this also. I mean, this is a long form filmed podcast. Um, this wouldn't work in conventional TV or in a movie or in conventional formats of media, similar to a magazine that needed to have this amount of space before this advert, because that advert pays for the, it's like, this goes online. And it can be whatever length is appropriate to engage the viewer in a proper theory of mind of the subject, of you in this instance. You know, who is Mike Finkel and how does Mike Finkel think? And what <laughs> what has Mike Finkel done in the world? And, you know, listening to a subject for a prolonged period of time, I do believe sort of fits into somebody's brain like, a theory of mind of that person of because as we discuss every mind is different every experience is different our minds evolve differently as we live and as we observe these different experience these different people with their different experiences we start to better understand the world we start to better understand human emotions um how the world works um the really thorny questions we've talked a lot about morality and ethics and things like that there are no real answers to those questions there never have been their philosophers have been debating these things for forever. But by listening to somebody and in their hard-earned experiences, engage with that, with that stone, you learn things, right? And that informs how other people live their lives. Anyway, I'm on a soapbox around no, what, no, the, no. I was, what the I was value chewing, of this I was chewing is. on all that. Yeah. I mean, I, I, short, but yet I'm still writing 200 page books. So I'm choosing things carefully. You have to you know, it's take, I don't know how many hours it takes people to read it, but I, I, I not, it takes one plane flight from Salt Lake City to Charles de Gaulle to read my book. That's my, that's my, uh, <laughs> that's my measuring stick. It's one international plane flight. You should be able to finish it, start and finish it on the same. It is a great size for a book. That's what I like them as. Yeah. But even like this interview. So I don't know about you and I don't know about other writers, uh, but I think all the time, about audience. Mm -hmm. Like even when I'm writing in flow state and you know doing the sound machine, I'm thinking that I'm trying to make something for someone else to digest. And so I don't, I've read about other writers that say they don't think about readers. I don't know if I believe that or were, they're just wired a little different, differently than me. So even this interview, I'm thinking, yeah, I'd like to talk about myself, but really if I was watching this, I want to hear what Mike says that can help me. And mm -hmm. it's like, it is a little bit playing about my mind that I think like, I know I like, I'm not going to try and talk in too many generalities, like to talk about specifics, but I also like there to be something that people can grasp themselves. Sure. And I'm not sure, sure but, but everybody that. encounters um, 
moral gray areas and every, everybody encounters situations where it's like, really, that's the rules? What the heck? That doesn't yeah. make any sense. Might this is so stupid. And like, why is it that this is the way that it is? Like, that's just absurd. Yes. And to like- <laughs> Yes, life is, is that pretty much life is one big moral gray area. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so to, to hear not just the stories that, that you write about and, and the actual what happened, but also the way that you've engaged with it and the way that you think about it is enlightening around all of that. I mean, that's how I think about it at least. I was just thinking about how unfair life is and how it is. It can be very unfair. And how I hear that in my house all the time. And then I, uh, I do have a response that is like, it kind of embarrassingly, like you hear your own dad's like whenever one of my children are like, that's not fair. That's whatever. And so some of the, you know, sometimes I will respond and be like, okay, do we want Beckett? That's my son's name. Do you want, uh, do you want perfect fairness? And I'll, you know, I'll look things up on the, on the computer. I'll show them. So, okay. So the, Average human being has one pair of shoes. So give me your nine pairs of shoes right now. Lives in one room, has like no outdoor, you know, no indoor plumbing. Do you really want to be, you want to be fair? Let's tell me if you want fairness. Primarily eats beans and rice almost yeah, every meal. Exactly. And it, it does sound like my father reading my ear, but like I do sometimes. It's a clever parenting trick. You know? I don't know. It's just like. And but we are deeply privileged to live yeah. in just being born in America is winning a lottery yeah. ticket. Yeah. If we... Uh, if we like, it's funny sometimes I like, again, maybe journalistic, natural journalistic sort of uh, positioning. I'm a born journalist. Like I sometimes think if we have enough energy to fight about, say, someone who's born a woman and feels like they're a man, like if we have enough energy to actually fight about that, well, let's just take a step back. How lucky are we to live in a country that's rich enough that we could fight about, you know, what's up? Like, we're not like trying to get food, trying to get shelter. We're like, so like, let's just take a step back, people. Like everything we're fighting about is like, oh, rich country. <laughs> like what restroom you go in is our big deal. You know, like, ah, how lucky are we? So, so sometimes I do take a little step back. And, and you've traveled a lot and you've gone yes. into very difficult environments and you've seen a right. lot of the world and how people live. And that is that is a privilege as well, but a lot of people don't have those experiences and don't necessarily even, it's one thing to kind of hear that or even read statistics somewhere, but it's a whole other thing to go spend time in Afghanistan or go spend time in Tanzania with the Hadza or um, really start to gain a sense of like just how different um, environments and world, like hu human environments can be. And Right, and as I yeah. said before, different and the same. I, right. I love, I mean, I've never met an avid traveler that I didn't at least feel some kinship with. Like I, I, I would wish that everyone had a wanderlust that I did, but most people do like to stay home near, near where they are. And, and I was also, as I was saying that, I was like, what if everyone had a wanderlust, wouldn't the whole world be a little homogenized? So I was wondering about that, but I do recommend, I do highly recommend travel, whether you're comfortable with it or not. And do not tell me that you cannot afford it because that's not true. Like mm -hmm. I, my first trip of my, my first real trip of my life, I was like a sophomore in university, but I went to Mexico. I had $90 and I had spent I think I had a $5 hotel room, took a bus in there and spent seven days on 90 bucks and had an insanely fascinating experience just over the Southern border of Mexico. So you can of course afford it. If you own a television, you could sell your television and spend a, get a week in Mexico. So don't, don't give me that excuse. The true excuse is you're afraid to go. Fine. Embrace the fear. Uh, but I really, I cannot uh, recommend enough traveling. I want to, I do want to ask about photographers. Um, oh, yes. Um, you have worked with some of the best photographers in the business and you've observed them, you've uh, been in the field with them. You know, they have their own creative practices, their own styles. Um, what have you learned about what makes a photographer a great photographer? Right, so I have always been jealous of photographers. Uh, I'm completely non-competitive with photographers. I happen to be a bad photographer, which I feel like nobody says that anymore because everyone runs around with a camera in their, in their pocket, but I've watched great photographers work and I barely take pictures because I know that I am not a talented photographer, but you know, I got to work a week with Andy Leibowitz. I got to work with James Noctway, like some of these amazing photographers, not to mention Chris Henderson and et, et al, you know, all these amazing ones. And I, so I've got to see them work. 
I've always been jealous because if you're illiterate, no matter what language you speak, no matter even if you can read, you can look at a photo. Whereas I offer a page of prints, and if you don't read English, it's, just gonna, you know, it's very cumbersome. So I've always been jealous of like, everyone can gather around and look at the back of the camera and see all those things. And I, would, I wish that writing had that universal, immediate thing. So I've, I, I, I get along with photographers great because I want them to be great, and I'm not trying to take any of their work, and, and I'm fascinated by that because I'm, I'm literally jealous. Like, I wish that I could show the art thief to anybody who didn't read English and they would all look at it and love Just it. Just instantaneously understand right. the and story it, and the meaning and the... Everyone's bringing their own social baggage to it, so you all see it slightly different, but you can still just see it. Whereas, like, if you don't speak English or you're illiterate, it's going to take me a long time to explain what I've written. And even then, um, you know, it's just, it's not worth it. So I, I love photographers. I wish I... No, I can't say I wish I were one because I have a huge advantage over photographers which is that during the adventure, the trip itself, I don't have to worry. Like I'm just kind of sitting back and observing while well, a photographer- Taking if, notes and- eh, Barely, you know, so, yes I am. But like, there's a lot more pressure on the photographer himself or herself to get the thing. Like you can't do like, oh, you know, back home I'll do a second and third and fourth draft of trying to get this beautiful shot in Mustang. So there's a lot of pressure and I'm actually enjoying the adventure more, I think, than a photographer who has to be very much on where I could be sort of, Floaty and so uh, you can experience it right in a natural sense. Whereas a photographer, I find as a photographer, when I'm on a shoot, I have a really hard time experiencing the remarkable experience and place that's happening because I'm so focused right. on the mental process right. of like what is the shot and where do, where should I be positioned and what lens should I have on and right. what's the meaning of the shot. You know, all the minds and all of those things, and so then you you end up getting home and you're like, wait, I just did this crazy thing. I was in this crazy place with these crazy people. And like, what happened? You know, like Exactly. And then you're putting something artificially, like, like a connection with another human to me should be as least encumbered as possible. But for you to do your job, you literally have to put a machine between us, whether it's a camera or a, a video. Um, I guess they're both called cameras, but you have to put something between us, Yeah, which is like, and I'm telling you that I don't even like to I like to put my tape recorder like off to the side and like look you in the eye and have the least amount of stuff between us. But, so I, I feel like I'm there more fully, but on the other hand, like I get home and like, oh, I have to just manipulate 26 letters. That seems like a really unnatural way to capture reality where you've captured it much more succinctly and beautifully. So it's like the little jealousy, but I don't really want to be, a anyway, I, I've thought a lot and I like, and just photographers tend to be curious, smart, fun, crazy, energetic people. And those are my, those are my peeps. Both you and a photographer have to build rapport with the story or the subject or the, the context and, and get immersed in it and be close to it. We've talked a lot about how, you, how you've done that with the subjects in your books. How have you seen photographers do that in their work? Some of these great photographers, is it different? How is it different? What have you observed? Right, so a photographer, the, the, some of the best ones I've known have been a little bit introverted, which I didn't know would be the case. I think you can, when I say you have to put a machine between us, but you can also hot, sort of hide behind that machine. And it's funny that you said you were, you felt like you were a little introverted, where I'm the one who's always asked, have to be asking questions, but a photographer almost doesn't want to. The only reason they want to engage with this with a subject is to uh, is to get them to sort of open up or relax. But really, they they can be introverted. So uh, it's just like it's a completely different process. And I'm like, uh, I was just thinking like to work with a some writers and photographers don't get along because if I'm trying to interview someone and someone wants to take a picture, then you've distracted that person. And yeah. I just, I've spent a lot of time and I like photography. So genuinely, I like, I like the art form that I sort of understand that there's going to be sometimes that you have to take center stage and sometimes that I have to take it. You there's that a out. dance. Yeah. Every shoot that I've ever been on with multiple media components that, cause that happens between photo and video as well, where there's some video project and then, you know, but the photographer needs to get the shot and there's, there's only one subject or one story or one, you know, focal point for the for the media objective and and we create lots of different deliverables around the thing that's happening and everybody's like 
in theory and a dance around it, but then, but then there's friction. Of course. Of course. It's like, <laughs> you're on a team. You're on a team. Yeah. If, if I re if it, I mean, depending upon that, I mean, if it's a big national geographic adventure, it's not like I can go to Mustang two weeks later and get the same thing. It's like, it, you just, you gotta be a, you gotta, you gotta be an adult. Like there's, there's multiple people. You sort of have to understand the situation. That's not to say like my story has gotten 10% worse because cameras and other people were there, but then it wouldn't have existed at all, you know, if it wasn't for a group. But uh, if it's truly like a writing project, like my, my personal projects, I travel by myself. Yeah. And like I told you, I don't even like a translator. I, you know, sometimes I, I have to have one, but it, the best for me for doing journalism is all by myself. And I don't mind traveling the world by myself. In fact, I like it. Yeah. But, uh, but when I am assigned to work with a photographer, of course, every photographer is different. Every writer is different. There has to be like, we, we'll, we'll talk it out. Yeah. I've gotten into some disagreements with photographers, of course. Of course. Yeah. How do you handle that on assignments, on expeditions? There's pressure, there's yeah. financial elements, there's time constraints and, and there's personalities. How yes. do you, how do you handle, um, conflict or, or, um, fallout even relationships that get complicated around all this? Are you, is it just, let's be assertive and let's try to figure this out as adults? Is it, is it different every time? Like, how do you handle these? Yeah, I think it is different every time, but also you should try and act like an adult every time I try and like, if I'm working with a photographer, I think we both want the same thing, which is the best possible piece of work. Uh, you know, our just comfort and our time don't even count. Like I'll be up all night if I need to, I'll be uncomfortable, hungry, hot. As long as we're both, we both want to do the best work possible. And especially like if I'm working for National Geographic, it's a photo first magazine. I remember my first assignment for National Geographic. I was paired with a photographer and, uh, he flew first class and I flew coach ca class. <laughs> Thank you, John Stanmeyer. <laughs> uh, um, that's got a sting. No, it was fine. It was like funny. I was just like, that's, I, I, I know the pecking order. So it depends. Like, it's really important that National Geographic has amazing photography. You know, if I was yeah. working for the New Yorker, maybe, or something like that, uh, I'll be like, hey, listen, you know, if they're like, but the sun is perfect right now. I'll say, okay, let's stop the interview and take some pictures, but then I want you out of here. You know, sometimes you just work it out. Yeah. Work it out. And sometimes there's friction and that's, creatively working with someone is challenging. Yeah. 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 Creativity is a hard space to collaborate around it. That is a really interesting con I mean, contradictory if, thing. Cause it's. Yeah. You're a filmmaker and that is a, there's, there's always going to be other people around. Yeah. You need a team. It, right. it turns out it's a team sport. It is. And I find journalism to be a solo sport. Right. I feel like it is sometimes, like I said, a driver or a translator, but really I like to be uh, by myself. So yeah, I, I got no, I got no secrets there. No great profound insights, but, uh, working with creative people, there's, uh, I was going to say, I tried, I, I would like to hear what photographers have to say about working with me. Like, you know, I don't want to pretend like I'm Mr. Relax cause I'm not that at all. Mm -hmm. I had a tradition of exhausting photographers for a while. How so? I just like to get up really early and work extremely late all day, all the time. And yeah. like, it's the, if you're on assignment, like every second is interesting. You've got a lot of, yeah. I remember when we were in Nepal, you were, um, we would get to a place and you had this urgency about you, like um, perhaps I'm never going to experience this place again. And you would, you would walk around and explore, like right away, we'd get to some place and you would, you would go for a walk and kind of, you know, interact with the place. And that was really important to you. Yeah. And it seemed like a, like a habit, a, a decision you make. Like this is how you're just gonna do your thing. This is how you're gonna live your life. Um, not everybody does that. I mean, even on the expeditions we're on, it's been a long day. You're tired. You've been hiking all day. You get there. You want to eat and drink something and hang out. You know. I mean, I believe to my to the detriment of my health that, uh, and I think I'm not wrong that the more you experience on the trip, the better your article will probably be, and I really, you know, it's so competitive. It's not like there's not a line out the door for people that want to take, you know, who ask a bunch of freelancers who wants to go to a cool place in Nepal on assignment for National Geographic. There's gonna be a lot of hands up. And so I'm aware of this and, you know, two week or three week expedition. I feel like I never almost, but this is something I almost never bring like a person. I read like crazy, but I never can read a book while I'm on assignment because if I have time to read that book, I should might as well walk around. 
Like you said, yeah. I want to experience it. You never know, and I know this from 30 years plus of journalism, you never know when a beautiful moment nugget is going to happen day or night. And so I tend not to spend any time in my hotel room, but I'm fortunate that I don't have any, every once in a while, I'll like write a journal entry or something like that. But really yeah. most of this stuff happens when I'm um, back home. And so this is the time to like have all my senses open. And I feel like, uh, yeah, yeah, I feel uh, I'm not apologizing for being like all spazzy and like nervous and things. And also, you know, there's a ton of pressure and, uh, I, yeah, I love being on assignment, but it is exhausting. Every gig feels like <clears throat> if you don't really stick the landing, it might be your last. And it's not a hundred percent false, right? You know what I mean? It might be, there's, it's so competitive. And so, and I genuinely like what we're doing and seeing like, I've never been to this town before, might may never again, and let's just see what it's like. And I don't know, I, I, yeah, I haven't talked to too many people like, what's it like to be on assignment with Finkel? Is he a big pain in the ass? Probably a big pain in the ass. <laughs> um, in <laughs> Nepal, the Mustang cave project we were part of, I mean, part of what we learned there was that there was very valuable art that had been stolen by the Kampa, the, the men from the land of Western Tibet, from the land of Kham, who were a guerrilla counterinsurgency fighting against Chinese occupation of Tibet for 30 years, CIA trained. Um, I'm sort of remembering this because we, we just had this conversation about art and its, its sort of twin star system with theft, how they're, it's, it's how they're integrally. <laughs> so here's the, an, an entire nation's guerrilla war unit was funded via theft of, of antiquities in, in Mustang, Nepal. Do you remember some of that? Did you write about that? Or was that just kind of in the background of our experience? I don't think that I wrote about art, the the providence of that stuff. I remember that, you know, we had this government, basically person that was making sure that we weren't actually stealing any art. There right. was like a suspicion and understandably so. I mean, look at those pieces. Like, did I want to take that gold uh, face mask home? Yes, I did. You know, all those things. It was great that we had like this I was really proud of the National Geographic gr crew. It was like strict, like this is the moral ba line and we're not gonna cross it. And we, I, I feel like we never did. Yeah. I mean, it was really, it was awesome, it's freeing. Um, and then of course I'm dealing with this art theft here. Yeah, the whole crazy square dance of works of art, the way it sort of like is stolen and created and goes around, you know, uh, that's basically been several years worth of reading for myself, uh, working on the new, Art Thief book, I don't have any profound answers, just, I think we should be, this is kind of a strange thought, I think we should be glad on some way that creative output is so revered that it's one of the things that you, that a uh, invading army wants to steal to make you feel bad, like that, that shows the power of artwork unto itself. Mm. It's at the highest, it's like the highest form of flattery in a sense. Right, exactly, exactly, I, yeah, I'm just having all these. You don't need to bring any politicians <laughs> into it. I'm, I, I just did a self edit there. <laughs> I, didn't want, I didn't want to go down that path. You don't want to fall through the trap door. No, like, no, no, no. I almost brought up something political. And I was like, screw that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, okay, left field question. If aliens were to just arrive tomorrow and you were somehow the interface with aliens and humanity and you had to give them one book so that they could understand humanity, what would that book be? That's funny. I was wondering where that question was going. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of a like. <laughs> I have a version of the, uh, one book, huh, for humanity? Bible's too obvious. Pretty good one, though, isn't it? Uh, um, I don't know if I've ever been asked this question before. God. I'm feeling like if I don't come up with something better I'm than I'm definitely the, putting you on the spot. I'm like, like, give I me the greatest book of all time. Uh, all right, <laughs> let me just rephrase the question. Yeah. So I actually, <laughs> I was like, did I talk to you about this, like in a tent somewhere? Because I have this weird, like alien, I was going to use the word fantasy. It sounds like a little kinky. <laughs> I have this. Weird, I thought you were going to ask me this question, and maybe you can answer while I'm coming up with. The, I'm going with the Bible. Sorry, guys. Maybe <laughs> the Bible, the Quran, and you know the Tibetan Book of the Dead. Let's just see. Our, no, I mean, I'm, I'm, I mean, I mean, there's a, there's a reason why these books are 
old. And I mean, I mean, how could you be wrong when saying the Bible were like a billion people? Uh, basically, that's the book. And then the Quran, 700 million, close to a billion people. Like, the, let's go with these great religious tomes that you have to. Yeah, I mean, a billion yeah. people plus today, but go back in time thousands of years and multiplies and it's it's 100 maybe billion people or 50 billion people, whatever the number is that have, that the knowledge has been um, passed through, passed, curated by, there's a, there's a sort of filtering process that distills value systems as a result. So, so yeah, great, great answer. It would definitely convey what humanity is all about. What was the question so you were going to ask? Here's what I thought you were going to say. Yeah. I don't know why this, I don't, I, I can't remember. I definitely didn't talk to you about this, Ted, but uh, I, I, this is like a question that weirdly goes through my head because I would like to know if there are, are we alone in the whole universe? Like, God, would yeah. that be, I, I mean, there's one of us, there's at least one planet with life on us. So there's probably more than one. Anyway, so this is like weird, um, existential question that comes to my head that I've actually asked myself. I don't know if I've spoken of it unstoned. Anyway, so uh, aliens come down and you're all alone. You're in your, you can walk out of your tent and this is what they say to you. Hello, we're aliens. We will show you the most amazing things in the universe. You have to get in our ship right now and we're just never coming back. It's too far. Do you get in or do you say goodbye and you're never gonna know that? And you can't bring anyone with you. You're about to have a child. You can't bring anyone with you. For a split second, you get in and you will disappear forever. You won't ever come back or you say no and you'll never know them. How about I mean, that's my existential question. <laughs> I just, I literally think about that. I would say no, honestly, but I'm at a stage in life. Yeah. I feel like 10 years ago, my immediate answer might've been yes. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. That's for some reason, I just like, you, luckily it's just a hypothetical, but it's like, <laughs> that just plays through my mind a little bit. Like, It might not be that far from I mean, I think humans are going to land on Mars in our lifetimes, and so there. So some humans are going to make the choice, because right, they're gonna, probably not going to come back. I mean, it's a long trip, and it seems very improbable that they're going to come back. So it it isn't that far fetched from choices humans will make at right. some point right. in the next decades. Let's just see how. The, I hope I I hope I get to see some of this stuff. I really I love this kind of topic. Yeah. I'm not a, I, w I would love to believe. So UFO, unidentified flying object. Of course, there's been plenty of unidentified flying objects, but it doesn't mean it came from another planet. I have this kind of unfortunate, I mean, I'm a journalist. This is why I have trouble with religion. I'm like, you know, well, just show me the stuff. Like, let me, like, you know, none of these like spooky, weird images. Like I, I need a little bit more than that to go. Uh, like, yeah. I don't know if you're smart enough to come from another planetary system, you'd probably be like, will either be seen or not seen. We're not gonna be kind of seen. Like, you know, you have, right. a, you have pretty good technology. So I I've been following with some um, interest, the, you know, UFO hearings and, you know, these pilots seeing weird things, but none of them, unfortunately, none of them have convinced me. That it's not convincing enough yet. No, dang it, sorry. Yeah, I wanna the, be convinced. The most convincing thing, this was like years ago now, was when, was when some pilots were like, just speaking over their, their speed. They sound like really credible, yeah, you know, yeah, fighter pilot types, yeah. and they're like, "Did you see that thing? Like, what the hell was that? Like, right. that to me was was wait, is there something here? You know? But but yeah, they're so they have these UFO hearings. It's like, what's even what's I'm, even happening? I mean, you got to bring the alien in to speak. You know, it's like I need a little more proof. It's right. Just like a, yeah, I mean, a cool thing that you saw at the cockpit. Who knows? Lights can flare and things like you know. There's many many explanations. I need, I need a little more proof. You read a whole National Geographic article on black holes. I love the idea that the, the multiverse idea, I know you can't ever really prove it, but this idea that what the Big Bang was, what the creation of our universe was, um, an extremely tight, condensed source of matter and energy, just boom, expanding out infinitely into it, outer space. Like a seed, I think, compared to a seed, right? Yeah, yeah. and light, light not being able to escape it, the speed of light not getting fast enough to ever escape it. I mean, that's exactly what a black hole is. Are yes, we, we're all li we're living in a black hole. Are we inside of a black hole? Definitely, no, not definitely. Uh, so um, I love this kind of stuff. It might be a little weird to talk about it because you can get, it, it sounds all stoner dorm room conversation-y, but I love this kind of stuff, like uh, the edges of human knowledge and then like what, you know, 
So uh, you, you asked me, are we living in a black hole? I believe that we are, but does it really matter? It kind of does. Like, what's the real nature of reality? You know, what's outside uh, the universe? These are great questions that I don't have answers to. But boy, I love researching that stuff. I love talking to theoretical. Those are my those yeah. are my rabbis. They're my are theoretical physicists, meaning that they can go to the edge of what we know and then extrapolate from there. And I don't think there's a huge difference between religion and theoretical physics, except except if something. Uh, is prove in, I'll just change my beliefs as opposed to like, when's the last time like any sort of major tenet of Christianity was changed in the last 2000 years. I don't think all these, right. like we haven't changed anything. So that's the only thing is I'm, I'm a little more flexible with my beliefs. Like, oh, I believe we live in a black hole. Look, we proved that. Okay. We don't live in a black hole. Like right. that's it. Easy, e easy. We showed something, you know, I'll change my opinion. Right. Yeah. The scientific method, but belief in the scientific method in and of itself is a belief. I mean, it is a sort of vertical that you could ascribe similar to religion. It's it's like, like there is utmost faith in the scientific method being true. And that faith comes from the things that it's done, right? Like it's, there's efficacy to it, like it's worked. Um, but everything's a belief structure. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> I don't know. I do. No, 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 that's, that's cool. I mean, like, like, I think I've repeated this a couple of times. I've like, I not only am um, okay with things being unknown, I actively like it. I want things to be unknown. So, yeah. right, uh, you know, uh, is, the, is, the, is the scientific whatever method a really its own, uh, cre its own creation? Uh, maybe. I kind of like, I'm not going to. But it's, if I were to put my, if I were a betting man, you know, I would pick that one over any, because of how effective it is. I mean, it, it works, right? I feel like I'm um, almost happy that I feel like humans, we don't actually know very much stuff at all. Literally, we don't know what dark matter and dark energy is. This is like 80% of the, the, like, we don't know anything. So everything that we think we know might be wrong on some level. I'm actually quite happy with that. Imagine if we, it, nothing would be worse than just knowing everything. Then I would be like, it'd be like writing the perfect, like someone's like, you know, is that your, I don't even think I've written a perfect sentence, let alone paragraph, let alone chapter, let alone book. But if I ever did, then I would just have to quit. Yeah. So I'm almost glad that, you know, I haven't done it. <laughs> What do you think? I, I love this little bit about Einstein and general relativity theory and he, truly radical questions. And I wonder how this relates to you in journalism. But, you know, he, he essentially, as a pretty young kid, basically had the question, if I was in a train and I was moving alongside something at the speed of light, what would it look like? Right. Which is like such a radical question. Like, where do you even? And, and basically general relativity theory fell out from, you know, him or maybe special relativity theory first and then general relativity later in life. But like the act of thinking up truly radical questions so as to find truth or explore towards truth. How do you think about that as a journalist when you're interviewing people, when you're trying to find truth? Uh... I mean, I think the operative phrase is trying to find, you know, I'm actually was thinking like, I don't even know if there is anything that can be called truth. And of course I wrote a whole book called True Story, uh, thinking about this question, you know, if the, if eight people are witness to it, like if there's a car crash and eight people are literally standing around there and you ask all eight people to write down exactly what happened, they will all be different. No one's trying to lie. It's just everybody has their own, I don't think there is a thing called truth. Uh, and I kind of am absolutely frustrated with that. I've, after, you know, going, running my mouth off on how true my books are, like there is really on some level, no single truth. I'm just, I'm talking slowly because I want to make sure that I believe what I'm saying. And uh, again, it seems to be a theme of the day, which is like comfort with uh, the comfort with um, not with something that's uncertainty. Comfort with uncertainty is sort of like, uh, so yeah, there is no, I think that any reader is not thinking, well, if a different writer wrote this book, it would be, any other writer wouldn't have written the, the, what, any of my books nearly the same way. Even if they were trying to hew to the utmost uh, degree of truth, they would pick other things that they thought were to focus on and highlight on. So there's, I don't even think, I, I, I try and be, 
I try and write nonfiction. Here we go again. Uh, nonfiction w- w- within the cleanest possible way, but I just also know that tr- that truth is truth is a word. Truth is like a goal that's impossible to achieve. But maybe I, I'm trying to go. I'm trying to go in that direction. But uh, yeah, I'd have to think about what I'm trying to say. I came across a quote: "Nonfiction is to architecture." as fiction is to painting. Yeah, I'm fi- I guess fair enough. There's creativity in both, yeah. right? And, there, and, yeah. But there's a sort of blank canvas, limitless creativity. Like if you're coming up with a story out of whole cloth and characters right. and what they think and feel and how they interrelate, it's like a blank piece of painting that you decide how to paint. Whereas there are certain obligations to architecture. It's like, the building can't fall down. Right. The septic system needs to work. Like you've, right. you, you, there are, there are ethical dimensions to building a building or architecting a building. Right. Like of can't. course you got the uh, college dorm rooms that are just basically look like shoe boxes and you got Frank Gehry, you know, both, you know, yeah. both forms of architecture. Now I would like, I'm a little more interested in Frank Gehry than the college dorm room. So yeah, there's plenty of latitude in architecture too, to be creative, but yes, you also have to have an engineer, make sure this is not going to fall down. But similarly, another quote I came across, somebody said this, it's like, the advantage that literature has over the law is that it has a much wider latitude to convey truth. So it's like, you know, in the creation of art, in the pursuit of literature, you you have a much broader paintbrush or, you know, spectrum of tools to use to to get at um, true meaning, true, what you know, what, whatever you want, morality in the case of some of your books. Um, I'm sort of throwing these out there. I'm just curious what you think of these thoughts. I mean, I love, listen, I read a lot. I read a lot of fiction and nonfiction and the subjects I choose specifically, it dawned on me while you're talking about this, are I think the fact that's held in the reader's mind that this is a true story gives it a frisian that's different from fiction. And I actually, I can, like anybody else, I can weep, I can be afraid, I can, you know, watching, I mean, why, why do, you know, when we watch a TV show, everyone sort of like lives and dies by these characters that are even fictitious. Like, you're right, there's like an emotional truth. Then I like to pick a topic where if, I believe that if I told you The Art Thief, my book was fiction made up, it would be a worse book. I think the fact that it actually happened gives the story a degree of, I don't know, the word craziness is coming to my mind. There's probably a lot of better ones. It gives, it, it gives, it gives the reader a degree of, um, you know, an emotional layer that wouldn't be there if it was fiction. Now, uh, fiction also, ha- you, can be, you can be carried away on many flights of fancy, but the fact that it's made up is always there in your mind. So I think that I could have picked a couple of topics that wouldn't I, I i i'm specifically choosing topics where the fact that it's fiction non-fiction the fact that it really happened adds to the story and i you know this is sort of a weird thing like i look for those moments where fiction where non-fiction where truth makes a story greater and there are other times when you want a fable to ca- come out with a different sort of deeper truth like behavioral things and so i don't know i'm i'm sort of re- i'm sort of circling around this uh, subject but uh I think that is one of the, I think I'm decent at choosing a topic that has sort of resonance because it's truth, truthful. Yeah, it's, it has a gravity to it. Cause it's, yeah, it's a good word. That's better. It's not, um, fanciful. It's, it's like you're interested in it because it's a real thing and you want to learn about it. It's, <laughs> it helps you understand the world, helps you understand other people and it's entertaining. Right. And it allow, I mean, I, I've listen, I've tried to write a lot of fiction and I find it to be very challenging. There's almost like too much choice. And I also like the fact that uh, the frustrations that sometimes a reader might feel reading some of my books, like, I wish that uh, the mother did something else. It's like, well, I'm bound by what happened. And so it's sort of like, it's like less pressure on me. Like I already know the beats of the story and all I have to do is concentrate on making like lovely sentences. Right. Uh, where I think you have two burdens 
uh, for a fiction writer. But boy, the problem with, I, I love the traveling so much. As you know, I like the reporting, the gumshoe reporting and the knocking on doors and the going through uh, lawyers' files. Like, I like that part of it. So I really, uh, I, I, I try to bring a lot of my favorite elements of fiction, like flow of sentences to nonfiction. And I'm trying to be strict about hewing to as close to whatever we all agree is the truth as possible. Who are your inspirations as writers? Well, I read widely. So, um, you know, I got a bunch of categories. I mean, I'm just finishing Cormac McCarthy's last book, May He Rest in Peace. I mentioned him earlier. I, I love him. There's a, so for nonfiction, for journalists, I'd say John McPhee, who's a, t a professor at Princeton now. In fact, he actually has a new book out. He's probably not that well read now. I would recommend coming into the country. But John McPhee wrote nonfiction, very strictly fact-checked nonfiction a lot for The New Yorker in this beautiful style. If anybody has not read John McPhee, go find a book by him and read it. I love Susan Orlean, who's a New Yorker writer. Um, I, you know, there are specific, you know, so I, I've, I've basically I've read the newspaper my whole life growing up. So it's like, I exposed to like how people impart a story. And, um, I think I mentioned Hemingway before, uh, he sort of taught me about like, you don't have to f show off your vocabulary or how complicated a sentence can be. Let the reader relax and let story, story is more important than metaphor. Like if story is like, and I love that. I love just being like immersed in a story. So I think I feel like I can talk about writers all night long. And, you know, the only thing I could say to people that like to read is like, if you're bored and feel like closing the book, you can, that's fine. These aren't like, you know, if you're not, if you're not having a school assignment, it's neither the writer's fault nor your fault that you're not making a connection. It's like, you can't make a connection with everyone. And so like go on to another book. Like how many people walk through a bookstore and say, Oh, I wish there were more books. You know, there's plenty of books. Uh, Do you read multiple books at once? when you're just living your daily life? Uh, that is a very good question. Um, yes, but I, I have two categories of reading, which is work reading, which I love. Like, you know, that's like, I wanna read everything there is to read about uh, art crime. And so I'll read every book just sort of for work. And then there's pleasure reading, which is not 100% pleasurable because there's always part of me that's like examining structure, examining flow, how long did you spend on this? And that I try to read one book at a time, but I have, there's my pile of reading uh, material has never abated in what I've been a reader for 49 years. It's never gone to zero. So uh, I, I'm, re I'm finishing up Stella Maris right now by Cormac McCarthy. And I have like 16 books. I'm like picturing it. I have a little pile. It's actually horizontal. So it's a, it's a, a little shelf of books I want to read next, but I'm not going to read all 16 of those next. Cause a, a dozen books going to work their way in there, but I'm, uh, I, I really just, I really like the activity of, of, of reading, um, more than I do of watching a screen. Maybe that's just a result of my age, but I, I actually don't find, and I think studies have proved this. I don't find watching a screen to be relaxing. It's actually enervating and it doesn't let me imagine things as much as I'd like to. I feel a little more creatively fulfilled by just reading words on a page and letting the, the, uh, images sort of flow in my own mind. I feel that that's, but that's just me. Everyone's different. My children are, would not agree with what I just said. They read on screens. Or watch shows. Do you do audiobooks ever? Or is it you really want the physical hardback in your hand? Yeah, I, I mean, listen, read any way that you're absorb, absorbing a piece of work, please do. I do not listen to audiobooks for a couple of reasons. First of all, I love music and I like podcasts. And so my time that I have to listen to stuff, I'm like, oh, well, music wasn't made to be like, I don't, I don't want to be like, I'm going to read sheet music today and listen to Cormac McCarthy. Like, no, I want to listen to the music and then read it. So uh, it's not the format for which go ahead and listen to books. It's just not my thing. I also sort of feel like I lose my, I, I lose the, fil, the, gotta just use the French word, the feel, the thread of the story. Um, when I'm you listening. can't pause when you want to pause and imagine as you imagine. You're sort of forced to move at the pace that the narrator's reading it. Yeah, I've failed a little bit driving and reading. Like I've noticed that any book that's complicated, then I lose the thread immediately. And so I have to listen to books that are a little more poppy, which is fine. I like reading all sorts of, you know, 
pop uh, pop cultural books, but uh, those are like I'd rather listen to music. So it's like I'm in this weird. I don't. Uh, yeah, audiobooks don't really work for me. Yeah, is there a book you've gifted uh, the most? I like Man's Search for Meaning. I like. I think the first book that. Uh, so, you know, most people think about when they're young, they get their like assigned books in school. And it's like really hard to read uh, Romeo and Juliet. To this day, I don't really want to read Romeo and Juliet. I want to watch a Shakespeare play, maybe. But uh, so the first book that blew my brain matter out the back of my head because it was assigned by school was The Catcher in the Rye by J.D. Salinger. And there was just like, oh, my God, that voice grabbed me. And like I was just gripped. And so I tend to give away like to younger people that are like, you know, uh, Ethan Frome sucks or, you know, Tess of the Dubervilles is terrible. I'm like, yeah, I mean, it's just not ready. For, just maybe try, uh, you know, Catcher in the Rye or something like that, which is just such a voicey thing. And it just, it's just like, I will never, you know, there's no going back from that moment where like I was gripped by that particular book at that particular age. And like reading was like, took on a new dimension for me. So I like to give away Catcher in the Rye. When did you know you wanted to be a writer? So I'm really lucky about this. Uh, I have many friends my age who are still wondering what they want to be if they grow up. And uh, my, mom, my mom showed me this journal I kept at age 10, age 10, a little journal. And it said in that journal, uh, I want to be a writer when I grow up. And then, there, and then I opened a parentheses and I said, if that doesn't work out, I want to be a mad scientist, by the way. But uh, so I actually wrote at age 10 that I wanted to be a writer and amazing to me that here I am uh, still pretending to be a writer. Um, so I am triply blessed in that category that I'm actually doing what I instinctively wanted to do. And I know that most people are in that category. It's like knowing, I mean, it's such a weird thing. What do you want to do? What, do you, what does anyone do? Like get up and have a day and go to sleep. It's like, you know, it's all about finding some sort of happiness and contentment, I think. But um, yeah, I've wanted to be a writer all my life. Yeah, you've you've known on on some level. Yeah, that's why all the crazy crap of the profession, that's why when I was fired, I was like, shit, I, I, have not, I, I don't know how to do anything else. Literally, I have no other skills. I mean, I, have, like, I can function in the world. I have no other good skills in, at all. That doesn't sound anxiety provoking at all. <laughs> it's like, what am I? Uh, kids and work and what am I going to do? Yeah, find yeah. a way to make it work. I know. I know. I, uh, I also like, you know, gosh, it's, it's just when you try and be like, you know, we talked a lot about truth today. When you try and be uh, like open and honest about anything, you all sort of declarative, like this is the rules. They all sort of start falling apart. Like, I'm also fortunate that I'm just wired to be generally a little weirdly optimistic in the face of it all. But I have plenty of friends who are prone to depression and that's not, it's not like you could be like, oh, read this book and you won't be. It's like, it's how you're wired. So like anything I say, like in general, is like sort of hard for me to accept. It's like, oh, just be happy. You know, like, eh, some people are not wired that way. So or choose what the, you want to do at age 10. Like, yeah, it's hard to, I listened to the craziest thing yesterday. I, I suffer from depression. I've done things about that in the past pieces of, of media. Um, I was listening to this Andrew Huberman podcast. He's a Stanford professor and he's talking about um, how they test SSRIs, um, which are like, um, you know, sorry, I'm blank, Prozac and um, Wellbutrin, other other drugs, the most prescribed drugs in the world by a long shot. The way that I... Oh, that could be me, sorry. Shit. It's okay. Do you uh, want to Yeah, I was going to... Yeah, yeah. No worries. Um, no, it's okay. SSRs uh, are like the um, psychotropic drugs that I, like fight. Uh, fight um, they help people to ward off depression, yeah. and they, you know, they basically um, increase the uptake at neurotransmitter sites of serotonin or dopamine yes. or neuroepinephrine. They they act as a sort of stimulant to absorb more of the of those 
things. Um, okay, but what I learned from this podcast that blew my mind is the way they test whether these drugs are effective or not. It, the term they use is preclinical trial, but they, it's it's barbaric actually. But they put um, a rat in a in a thing of of water and they measure how long it takes before the rat drowns. And they save the rat. They resuscitate. They bring back. They, you know, the, the rat's fighting to swim and survive, and then, and then it stops fighting at some point in time. And they measure that. Then they administer um, this SSRI, and then they do it again, and they see whether the rat try to swim for longer or not. And that's the basis upon which SSRIs are measured in preclinical trials, which is crazy. I know this is a tangent. I just couldn't believe that that's how that works um because they're basically trying to understand the hopefulness or hopelessness of the rat and <laughs> it's just like anyway we can we can jump back into things but this andrew huberman podcast was amazing i've suffered from depression a lot of my life and and it's and he he talks a lot about psychedelic assisted therapy and um and the, there's some miracles happening in that department um but you just were reminding me of all of this with respect to some friends who are less optimistic perhaps about the future. And there is something to that with mental health and all these things. I've noted that some of the, maybe I'm just not, I mean, I, I've actually thought to myself, I'm kind of glad I'm not a genius. Like I, the smart, some of the smartest people I know are prone to depression and like almost all the greatest, some of the artists I most admire are, you know, I liked reading David Foster Wallace who committed suicide. Like I'm almost like, whew, I avoided, like, I'm almost like glad oh, I'm not, I'm not of that, ge that genius level. It seems like a burden. Like it's almost, uh, it's almost good to be a little bit, uh, softer in the head than like this, like that. And I actually, I actually know like self-deprecation. I actually mean that entirely. Like, I think that some of the people that struggle most with life are also what would be objectively like the sharpest people. And, uh, like, uh, I don't know that. Yeah. So this age, this age of being able to improve one's mood and outlook on life, I find to be important. Like, you know, I'm not opposed to any uh, crutch, medicine, weed, microdosing, macrodosing, like anything yeah. that helps out is, if, is one, you know, one should, one should take, one should utilize. I think psychedelics have been used in this capacity throughout time and we've just sort of forgotten in the last 40 years. I, th I think with respect to healing people and trauma, you know, it, it seems like there's been a sort of wizard in the high tower or a shaman in the deep woods or, you know, some sort of respected elder figure of a culture who's administered or managed or guarded the secret of psychedelics and, and use them to heal people with respect to trauma. I mean, imagine how much trauma existed in ancient times. <laughs> Compared to now, I mean, that's I mean, I just wonder if we had the time to actually focus on it. We were too busy running away from whatever was causing the trauma. They probably didn't call it that. Right, 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 right. It's like the physiological response, the nervous system response, must have still been similar. I mean, I think you should have on your show some one of, one of these uh, shaman type people. I've uh, only, uh, you know, I, I went through a large phase of trying uh, psychedelics, and I found it to be, without exception, uh, wonderful. <laughs> like it's helped yeah. me out creatively, personally soulfully you know there's a whole bunch of stuff yeah you know, what the uh, landscape between our ears is incredibly rich almost unknown too we really don't understand exactly how the brain works just just i love your story about like you know well the best we can do is throw rats in water like all i was <laughs> all i was thinking when you were telling that story is yeah we don't really like it just proves that we really don't know that much like we don't it, it, it's kind of working i think there's yeah. i think i read somewhere now this might be wrong that we're not even 100 percent sure how radio works but we just know it does and we all get the radio station <laughs> like you know it took us a little while to figure it out it's like let's it works why that's a much more difficult question like, i don't know the rat swims a little longer G give it to ted <laughs> yeah totally sometimes things just work i mean nobody seems to really know how ai is working like there's a lot of theories right. but it's sort it seems to just all of a sudden be working and everyone's like oh my god it works oh you know? eyes did you say ai oh ai oh yeah. ai yeah, yeah. Yeah, is it working? I'm not sure if but it's But also, working. how do eyes work? I mean, <laughs> I, yeah, I spent a lot of time. I was, I, <laughs> I fell into a little hole about that during my uh, during my um, art uh, thief uh, research. I mean, I had a whole pandemic to read books, and I was in the middle of this thing, so I read. I'm not going to get into it, but I do like the fact that um, just a little 
momentary aside that we see, we literally see everything upside down. Your son is going to see the world upside, like literally you're going to be upside down for about a week or so. And then the human brain is so amazing. Like I am literally seeing you upside down. That is the way it goes because all the light bounces and the brain flips it upside down. Now they have these glasses. I don't know Whoa. what I'm talking about. They have these glasses that flip the world upside down. And it takes about a, if you wear those glasses for a week, you'll flip everything right side up and then you'll take them off and everything goes upside down for, yeah, your brain like flips everything around. Yeah. Your son's going to see everything who hasn't actually opened his eyes yet. will see everything upside down for about a week till the brain's like, oh shit, everything's upside down. We're going to flip it around. I don't know what that means. We're but it so just malleable to like the, the way the world is, our environment, the norms, values, institutions, all these things. It, similarly, our brains adjust to, you know, right? we live in this place, this world, right. and we just sort of, but it like all could be different. I mean, and, and this is, we, we talked about this in some of the books that you've written, but you sort of try to find the instances where somebody has a code, has an ethic, but it is different. I sometimes think that living in a city, which, by the way, was in the, in the history of humanity, was just invented like two minutes ago. We, we think it's fine to like live in boxes stacked across one another, drive like cars were just invented like one second ago in the history of humanity. Yet we can go like eighty miles an hour in like a like a like a, like a metal box. That's crazy, man! And the brain's just like, yep, yeah, we'll do that. Like a bicycle, just like you, you're going to teach a kid how to drive uh, ride a bicycle in about. Five years from now, just, okay, you got these round wheels and you're just going to sit on the middle and balance. Like, it just looks, it looks like, just take a half step back. It's freaking impossible that someone could ride a bicycle, yet we can all hop on for the rest of our lives. That is crazy. Anyway. There's technology and then there's the human interface with technology yeah. and the things that really work. We're adaptable motherfuckers. Yeah. We are. Yeah. Yeah. It's also, it's also crazy. Um, well... I feel like we have, we have touched upon, oh, I think we're just about there. We've almost solved, I think there's world peace. Everyone's well fed and now we're all happy. What a, what a successful morning. <laughs> I'm going to live in this fantasy world till I step out the door and realize <laughs> that it may not be true. But at this moment, I do feel like there's just some frisson in me that we solved it all. Yeah. Well, thank you for your time today. Really appreciate this conversation. Thank you. It has been Really fun. Thank you.